Welcome to the One Life One Chance Podcast. I'm your host, Toby Morse. Today, I have a very, very, very special guest, a good friend of mine for over 20 years. He's a tattoo artist. He's a father. He's a husband. He's a photographer, and he's super handsome. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome <laughs> to the podcast, Mr. Juan Puente. What's up, Toby? All right, bud. Oh, doing good after that lunch. Yeah, it was a good lunch, right? Definitely. I took my man Juan to our Crossroads to get the burger today. and uh, Loved it. Little vegan life going on here in Los Angeles. We'll see what happens. <laughs> so before we get to the man, the myth, the legend Juan Puente, who the world has come to love, I'd like to take you back to the roots and the history of you and your upbringing and, and, and growing up. And were you born in uh, where you born? Cal- I know you were born in California, but no, actually I was born in Mexico. Oh shit! Learn something every day. Yeah, I don't know if you heard this story. <laughs> I found out last year. Oh yeah, this is, this is an amazing story <laughs> that I was adopted, which yeah. is like the complete most ridiculous thing ever you know finding out at 48 years old that yeah you're adopted but it it didn't really affect me like everybody asked if i was okay but more than anything it was just you know my parents actually went through some crazy steps just to get me yeah you know what i mean so when i found out it was it was a conversation on the phone this and that and then it, it really all hit me at once because i just come through my mom's whole house and there's no pictures of my mom pregnant so oh, I was just I, immediately I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is j- just with the little bit that I knew." I'm like, "It's true," you know. I'm like, uh, so your mom had passed. Rest in peace to your mom. Yeah. And then, so all of a sudden, other work people started talking from well, your family. Well, my aunt wanted me to come back. I lived in I live in San Francisco, so this is yeah. in Orange County, Mission Viejo, California. So she came to a little party I had for my mom. She's like, "We have to talk," and I'm like, "Look, I live in San Francisco. Can you just tell me what we got to talk about now?" Like, yeah. We went back and forth for months with this. And then finally one day she called me frantically, like, you need to come down here. Like, I can't. I don't have time. So, well, there's there's someone looking for you. She wouldn't tell me. Someone's looking for you. And gave me a name. I'm like, okay, does she, I don't know, is she, I just sold this house. Is she looking for money? No, 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 nothing like that. She just, you need, if she pops up on your, you know, computer radar or whatever, you should hit her up. Yeah. Hang up the phone. Go on Facebook for just to see what she's talking about. And there is a woman with a friend request. Click on accept. And then just I just get barraged with all these like, oh, my God, I can't believe I found you. And I'm like, I'm like I don't even know. Excuse me. And I'm, and I'm texting back. I'm yeah. like, I don't even know who you are. What this, can you tell me what this is about? She's like, mm-hmm. I'm your sister. And I'm like, oh, excuse me? I go, let me get right back to you. And I'm texting. I call my aunt right back. And she's like, oh, I just broke down crying. Trying to tell you this forever. Her and my mom were beef. Her, my mom and her two sisters were beefing at the time of her death. Yeah. And they always had a tumultuous ish relationship. Yeah. Was it because of that? I think that was well, your secret. I think that they were trying to tell, like, look, here's your chance to tell Juan, little Juanita that what, what's really going on. And my mom was like, mind your own business. And so that was that. Damn. And, but, you know, I mean, whatever. My mom just, you know, she protected, protected that thing you, for yeah. like 48 years. You know, she's not going to let it go now. Yeah. And like my mom and dad were not going to tell me. That was my mom died with the secret. My dad, I went get, to the grave with it. Yeah, yeah. I get, it. I got it out of him, you know. And he was, I told, I had to tell him it didn't, cha- it doesn't change anything, Dad. You know, you're was my that a hard dad, conversation raised, to have. No, it actually wasn't. He was, it was hard just getting it out of him. He yeah, was just like mean. it was like the James Bond couple of secrets. <laughs> like they, they kept it good. And yeah. after I found out, my cousins started texting me. Hey, dude, we heard you found out. They all knew. We heard you found out. You're still in the family. We want you to know. We Were still you love you. That these people knew and nobody told you at all? Not at all. Okay. I, I actually was. If you would have told me, let's say anywhere from 15 to 20, you know, I would have made an excuse, gone up the deep end, yeah. picked up some bad habits, Well, whatever. True. But no. You know, my mom and dad wanted me. They couldn't have me. So they, you know, they, they, but it worked out somehow miraculously that we, that came to happen. Yeah. You know, me and my sister were adopted by family members. Like I went to my mom and dad and my sister went to an uncle of my mom's and his wife that couldn't have kids. Gotcha. So we lucked out. If you want to look at it. So apparently there was a woman in church with too, too many kids. We were the youngest. Okay. So there's other people out. There's other brothers or sisters who knows what their life ended up as? Because the the woman, my my real mom's dude split. Yeah, she's in church by herself with all these kids. Like, you know, so, like something that you see out of a movie, you know? Yeah. And so my mom's uncle just like saw this opportunity. Like, look, my wife can't have kids. My niece can't have kids. We strike up a deal. It's Mexico in 1968. I'll take care of all the paperwork, which is really just clipping them some money. Yeah. And making a couple fake birth certificates. Done. It's crazy, man. And you know, here we are. Here we are. So, how was your childhood? 
it was great. You know what I mean? My parents worked, worked. They mm-hmm. just working people, you know? And yeah. My mom worked in retail, like early stores like Jemco, which I don't even know if they had them on the East Coast. But it was Not like, it was like a that. first membership store like in yeah. Southern California. And then my dad worked uh, maintenance at like a, it's called Leisure World. It's like an old folks retirement. Okay. You, you, can, you can get like an apartment or a condo. Yeah. Or, and then one day they decided like they're going to open up a business. And so they opened up a baby store. Oh, and then wow. they did that. And there was no baby stores at Back then. then. So I seen like the rise and fall of mom and pop literal businesses my whole life. Everybody's seen it. Yeah, you yeah. know. But I seen it like from the craziest climbs ever to then let's say, for example, Babies R Us opens up. Yeah. Or one of your employees steals some catalogs and opens up this sounds funny, opens up <laughs> six miles away. And that's too close because we didn't have anybody within a 20-mile radius of us back mm, then. Gotcha. So we had it all. We had people coming yeah. from far yeah. to come to this store. And then stores started, then people got hit to the skip. Like, you know, oh, my God. Like, why, why are people traveling 25 miles to a baby store yeah. when we can open one up, and, you know, and grab these? No, on and on and on, you know? So yeah. seeing the rise and fall and then. You know, they had some bad business decisions, and they had, you know, they bought. Well, my mom always wanted more, you know. Yeah. I mean, so we had a house that we never even lived in, and a gigantic wow. house that that was. Uh, my I had an aunt who lived and passed away, but you know, the, but we, my mom didn't trust people to rent anything. Like she's like, mm-hmm. no hell no, I'm not renting it to anybody. <laughs> like we had like a gigantic house that there's only three of us. Yeah, you know, so slowly but surely, she had helped me buy the house that I grew up in. Like where they first got. Mm-hmm. So after the whole course of life came and went they moved back into that house and i was already out traveling tattooing yeah in other states and or uh, other cities you know i, I yeah. moved to san diego and then san francisco and but you know south orange county mission viejo in the 80s that's you know that's where i grew up yeah how was school for you like did you like school did you get good grades did no you... i got horrible i was lazy though mm. yeah i didn't not that i i just didn't like school like yeah. I, I liked hanging out did that but i was <laughs> back but you know socializing but I used to take summer school, and they give me a, they give you a test to see what kind of book they'd give you for the class in oh, summer yeah, school, yeah. and they give me the same book of the class I just failed. You know, and the lady's like, oh, "Look, shit. you know, you're not dumb, you're just lazy." Yeah. So you get the same book. I'm like, "Come on, like, what's the point of failing if I can't get an easier book?" You know, yeah. they give me, the, they give me the same <laughs> book. You know, but. You know, like in South Orange County, so Mission Viejo was next to a little town called San Juan Capistrano, mm-hmm. and that's where all my punk rock buddies. Where I used to hang out. Okay. I'd go to San Juan Capistrano. How old were you then? Like, what grade was it? You were going to I was like out? freshman in high school. Like, you know, I went to, I went to a private Catholic school oh, in wow. Mission San Juan Capistrano. Met a couple of the friends that are still friends to this day. And then we went to public school. Okay. And then, you know, finished public school and just carried graduated on. Graduated? Yeah. Right. yeah I graduated. What did you want to do when you graduated? You know, I really don't. My mom wanted me to be a doctor. Wow. That's for sure. But that's what she wanted me to yeah. be, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I didn't know. I worked for the family business. Yeah. I did this. And, and I got a job at UPS. Yeah. That was like my my first job, like outside of a group family of friends or family yeah. business. And then uh, from there, and I still didn't even have a tattoo. I didn't, all my friends are covered in tattoos. And there was a couple of guys in the in the the group that tattooed. But I didn't have any. And then one day I just got one I did, on a whim. Some ch- like kanji at that, like some like just like, some little. Who knows? You still if it have even, it. I still have it. I don't Sick. even know if it means what it says, you know. But <laughs> I got it, and it was just like that was got the buzz. It, it yeah. Bug. Talk about getting hooked on yeah. something, you know, like just full force. Yeah. So yeah. you were going, you were going to punk shows at the time. Oh yeah, 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 young. You know, here. Well, we're in L.A. now, so it's like Olympic Auditorium. Yeah. Then there was Fenders in Long Beach, and then that, then, then they always had shows like in ran, like if it wasn't Gold, it was even other random show. Mm-hmm. There was a place called Celebrity Theater in Anaheim, I think it was, and there yeah. was always somewhere to have a show, you know. And yeah. so we'd, you know, climb into someone's car or like just find a way. My mom dropped me off at the first bunch of shows. It was Damn. the worst, like right in front <laughs> of the Olympic Auditorium with like three thousand people. You know, wow. give me a kiss, or you're not getting out of the car. That's like, cool. She did that though, man. She she wasn't worried about you going to see the crazy music and shit or not. Well, the first time we went, she called uh, my cousin. Who was a sheriff in Los Angeles? Yeah, and he had been on TV. He's that guy, like telling you know, talking to the news. Yeah, you know, this is nineteen eighty three, four, yeah. something like that. And uh, I just see my mom on the phone, like telling him they're talking in Spanish. Like, oh, what's it? You know, where is it? Like, oh, it's where is it? When he does it, called the, it's called the Olympic Auditorium. 
And she's like, oh, and I had a flyer and I gave it to her and she read the address and I could just see her expression change. <laughs> Sketchy ass and, 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 you know, and she's like looking at me on the phone and looking at me and, like, and just my cousin's talking in the back. And I'm like, oh God, I'm not going to be able to go. <laughs> and she, she's like, all right, we're, oh, we're taking you. I'm like, I'm like, all right, that's cool, you know. But Damn. And that was, you know, that was the beginnings of it. Yeah. Did you, um, so were you like an artist? Were you, were you drawing and stuff before? You, you know, we made our leather jackets. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like, you know, do some paint on that, some stud, you know, do all that stuff. Yeah. So we did that, you know what I mean? Like, for, like art, art, not so much, but yeah. like, you know, our jacket wanted to look good. So, you know, we actually, we, we would actually take time to do stuff like that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then, uh, so I was at UPS, I got my first tattoo, then I was starting to get a bunch of tattoos. And uh, you know my friends around. They had some of them had more tattoos than others. And yeah. then finally, someone out of the blue was like, "Hey, dude, you should get tattooed. You should do tattoos. Remember you did this jacket?" And I'm like, ah. "Huh?" And I really didn't think about it much. It's kind of like, eh. And I kept getting tattooed. Yeah. And then uh, I'm surprised that you have tattoos at UPS back then too. Well, it's funny because like they were all under the sleeves. Like I got two armbands that will show you where they stopped. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, one day. I've been getting tattooed by Corey Miller, mm -hmm. who has a shop in Upland called uh, Six Feet Under, and okay. be and before that it was a shop called Optic Overdrive, and before that he worked at Tattoo Land, and before that <laughs> I met him in a place called Fat George's okay. that was in uh, La Puente, California, off a of valley. Gotcha. And so he's tattooing me a bunch, and he's just drawing shit on it, just a, you know stuff's really cool, black and gray stuff. And finally, I just like it, it just rolled off my tongue. I was like, hey man, you know. I want to learn how to tattoo and just the eye rolls of everybody in the room, like, oh, really? Here we go, like, here we go yeah. again. Yeah. And, and mind you, this is a long time ago. Yeah. So there's no TV, there's no phones, there's mm -hmm. no billboards, there's no nothing. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, he kind of like, look, dude, you don't know how many people ask me. Come on, man. Like, you know, so I let it go. I'm like, no, I'm serious, you know. So I think I asked him here and there. And then, uh, were you 100% serious about I it? I was serious, yeah. you know, but you know, he just wanted to see. And I, I would, did never work at the shop, I hung out, yeah. you know, I, whatever. There's a lot of famous people actually came to this little tattoo shop, mm -hmm. oddly enough. I didn't know because I had still had, yeah, I was still learning the history of everything. And then finally, one day after pestering him, I don't know, I forget how long I pestered him for, he finally said, Okay, yeah, and I was like, Really? He's like, oh, You're still serious? I'm like, oh, Yeah, I've been serious the whole time, I've been asking. Mm -hmm. He's like, All right, well, listen, save your chips, we'll get. Some equipment. I'll help you with the equipment. I'll help you get started. But don't tell anybody. Yeah. Don't tell anybody until you're good that I yeah. helped you. But just don't. This is you don't share this. You don't share that. Blah blah. I'm like, all right, man. Whatever. You, you tell me what to do. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. You tell me what needs to be done, and I'll go from there. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning. Yeah. You know. And uh, it takes a long time to be apprentice because Frankie said back in the day it took like five years to be an was, apprentice. See this. I, this wasn't an apprenticeship. Yeah. So he just told him, you know, he got me the stuff. And so now I'm going off of sheer memory, like setting up a machine mm -hmm. and doing this and doing that. And okay, you know, and I remember the first tattoo I did, I made a stand. So it was, and it was like a Korean kanji. So it was really simple. Yeah. And I, and there's like five guys in my bedroom upstairs and I got this roll away <laughs> desk and I'm just nervous. And I, got, I think I got everything set up right. And stencils on, I go to do this line, nothing. And I'm like, what do you mean nothing? I just did everything the way I remember. Sure, yeah. So now I'm like messing around with this machine, finally yeah. get it to work. And then you go from there, you know? Yeah. I mean? So now I'm just tattooing. At that point, I just like, okay, a couple buddies. How you old know, are you then? 21. Okay. And uh, just started, you know, in my, in, my, in, my, in my room originally. And then I moved into the house that I grew up in. So I was just tattooing there. Wait, at UPS still? Yes. You know, Sick. and just so I was just like doing it, doing it. Yeah, like, that's grind. And then I have a couple friends. One buddy of mine I just tattooed yesterday at a shop here in Lake Forest called Vatican. He, uh, we went to high school together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I, but I, I mean, I got, I started, he started getting tattooed on me after I got, was good, you know. Yeah, and then, yeah. But uh, we were just laughing about it, just thinking about growing up in Mission Viejo. Like, you know, the first one of, uh, who knows if the first tattoo to come out of there or, you know, it probably yeah. won't be the last, but. You know, just thinking about the time, and there, there's another cat too that was that lived on my street. He used to have a ramp in his backyard. This dude's name is Craig, Craig Artem, and he's still I still see him on <laughs> I still see him on uh, into the Facebook and stuff. And man, I tattooed the shit out of that dude. And you know, I he's like a guinea pig. 
yes and no. These dudes came right from the beginning. They wanted to get tattooed. They, okay. had, they had confidence in me. Yeah. They would break me off a little bit of money. Like, you know, most people you'd be tattooing for free. Yeah. These guys like paid me. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I was like, oh man, this is this is amazing, you know. Yeah. And, and Craig got a bunch of cool stuff and then this is happening, and I, I get an offer to do a tryout at a little shop. Didn't get the job. It's okay. a job that Lindsay worked at, too. Oh, uh, shit. But for that matter. <laughs> and so didn't get the job. And Corey, I'm just bummed. And Corey's yeah. like, listen, dude, you weren't going to get your first job. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's, just, it's not how it works. Uh, yeah. You'll get your second job, but you're not going to get the first one. Yeah. So that was at the beginning of summer. By the end of summer, I was busy. It was, you know, a lot of people tattooing way more people, got a little faster. Yeah. Then I got offered a job. At Classic. Oh, shit. And I got that job. Bring it back to Classic. And then I uh, I quit UPS, and the, the rest is kind of history. From Damn. There. So what year was that, you think? 1992. I left UPS. I, because I remember the first Ink Slingers Ball that was in Hollywood was 1992. Yeah. It was in September. The first month I worked at Classic was like either end of July or August of that year. Because Eric Mosky went to the convention. I went to the first day of the convention, got tattooed. Eric went the second day, bought me a machine. Then I went the third day and got tattooed again. Because it was just like of conventions at that time was like one a year. Yeah. Maybe. And, and was, everybody was there. And you know, No, actually, I mean, everybody that was good was there. Yeah. But it was way more homey and way more small. Yeah. So you filled up the Hollywood Palladium with tattooers. I mean, and it was international. Like the best people from yeah. all over the world were there. And so... It was probably the first of its kind in the United States that was of that proportion. Mm-hmm. And just, it's Hollywood. It's just wild. It's not yeah. United too. It just was, it was magical. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Just hanging out, meeting people and like old timers now. Like you have a lot of old timers now that are passing away, like left and mm-hmm. right at this point. And it's just like, whoa. Yeah. Like, you know, these, you know, I mean, I guess we all feel, you know, you're never going to get that old where you're going to pass away or something. Yeah. You know, some kind of health is going to, problems gonna take over your life or whatever and mm-hmm. and then you blank and you're 50 and then you know your heroes are 20 years older than I you. know it's crazy man and you're just kind of like what the fuck man? yeah like, so right then were, you, were your parents stoked for you were they, how, were they feeling like you quitting UPS and then becoming a tattoo artist so they were bummed yeah they, oh, sure. they, they, so so not only did they fight to get me right you know mm. what I mean so they, yeah. they lived through the punk which rock. you didn't know about that back then I yeah. didn't know they lived through the punk rock years which now makes a whole new <laughs> light like you know my dad used to look at me and like kind of <laughs> disgust like just like fuck man like fuck really you. my only kid is looks like this guy like mm. come on <laughs> later in my 20s like we we we, were, we bumped heads for a little while but nothing like nothing bad yeah and then one day I wanted to go shoot some pool and my mom was like you know you should take your dad he's a pretty good pool player I'm like he is come on he's like I used to play a lot he's like yeah why'd you take him I'm like let's all go out because I didn't want to be alone with my dad I didn't want to you know him. whatever I just maybe didn't feel as comfortable mm-hmm. as I should have yeah that's for sure and so we went to this little place that was down the street from my house and Fucking smoked me like I wasn't even there, Holy and I shit. was just like, "Oh, I asked my mom, what the what the fuck? Like, really? Like, how the, how did this happen?" And my mom's like, "Do you think he went to school? Like, no, oh, he shit. worked he worked his whole life and spent time in bars. Like, wow, that's how he learned how to play pool. Like, he didn't play learn how to play pool because his dad was a billiard master. Mm-hmm. He, he learned because he was hanging out. Interesting. And I was like, oh, so they were bombed." But, you know, my mom was like, oh, it's a fad. You know, you're still young. You'll grow out of it. You can go back to being a doctor. <laughs> you know, whatever the, whatever the fuck you're going to say, you know, do. Yeah. And then one day my mom called me and my grandma on my dad's side had, had passed. Oh, shit. And uh, we weren't close. So it wasn't, it didn't affect me like it would if we were, like, they yeah. watched me or anything. But, you know, so he, she's like, oh, I don't have any money to send your dad there. And I was like, I'll call you right back. So I called the airline, got my dad a ticket. And that's when you could just call and reserve one and pay it on the spot. Like, yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, no no holding or anything like that. Drove from Fullerton to Mission Viejo, picked up my dad, told my mom to tell my dad to pack a bag, picked him up, took him to uh airport, mm-hmm. told him about the ticket, gave him some money, and we gotta go home for a little bit. Yeah. You know, and he's like and I wouldn't really tell him why. Yeah. But you know, and wow. you know, so after that happened. They realize somewhat of the value that I wasn't 
I wasn't doing a hobby. Yeah. That, I, I mean, mean I, I wasn't just sitting around not making any responsible money. Responsible adult and shit. Yeah. I, mean, I was living. doing stuff that paid. Yeah. You know, and so after that fact happened, they had a, a I believe, a way more uh, respect for me and what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And they, I think they realized then that it wasn't going to be a fad either. Yeah. You you're know? onto something. You're part of something. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. So, how many years have been tattooing for now? Well, so what is that? Twenty seven years. So yeah. Twenty eight. That's crazy. And, and you and you take photos too. You take amazing photos. Not many people know that about you. I mean, I love. I, you know, when I'd say probably early, early, late late nineties, I started getting into photography. But before yeah. then, I actually always had a camera, and just to document us hanging out like yeah. my friends and tatt- going to tattoo conventions yeah. and other people's tattoos like not even for myself and then uh 98 i went to the new york convention i was at the rose, the rose Land. Land, yeah. yeah and that i was met, crazy i met too. i forgot her name i was gonna kill me now this photographer girl so super cool and yeah she uh took me to b and h i wanted to buy a camera and i had some money I and, and she's like oh like oh you already got these lenses let's go i'll, I'll take you yeah and totally like walked me through the whole thing like all right it's Here awesome. you go, and then from there I just never stopped taking pictures. You and didn't, then, man. And then I, and then I started taking pictures of bands. Like a lot of friends were in bands. Like yeah. hey, you know, like you know, and, and it it wasn't as it's, it's kind of crazy. It wasn't as serious as it is now. Like now you got to sign stuff and do all these other things for yeah. some things. But you know, oh, you want a photo pass? Sure, here, take it. You know what I mean? Nobody it's way cares. Different. You know, it, one thing that has not changed is it's still only three songs. <laughs> and then, yeah, you know, and then first you three go songs, first right. three songs, and you got to get the fuck out of the, yeah. the barricade. But you know, but uh, it was it's it was a blessing too. You mm-hmm. know, because I really love taking pictures of the shows. I love being I love the shows. Yeah, you know what I mean. You're always so, a show goer, yeah. And I, I'll, you know, I still go to shows. And you know, right now it's a little. I, I, now I think I like to enjoy the show more than taking. I mean, the band has yeah. really got to be, and I got to know the place. And I know the places, so I go, okay. What are my what are my pros and cons here? Mm-hmm. Like I've already shot this band at a killer place. This place is gonna have twenty photographers in this barricade. No, you know everything's no flash. Yeah. I'm like, okay, so maybe I'll just wait. maybe I just won't. Maybe I'll just go in and enjoy my time. You know, maybe yeah. with my wife or something like that. Just, I'm just gonna go to the show yeah. party and hang out. So now it's a little more pick and choose. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? But uh, I still like taking a lot of photos. More, more stuff now. Just on the street. You know, street photography. And yeah. Just, Catching moments. He took a bunch of uh, photos of H two O. Yeah, a lot of photos. The ones at Spotlight was awesome too. That's, that's, like a, that's on Spotify. Yeah, I was pretty excited. <laughs> that. that was pretty good. You know, I didn't even know that. I was like, wow. You know, like, you love music so much. You went to so many shows and started photographing, taking pictures of the bands. You never wanted to play music or be in a band. You know, I was in a band with some friends oh, a shit. long time ago. You know, and it was you the singer. Yes. Oh and shit. It, somewhere there is a tape rolling that uh, <laughs> of the only show we ever played in wow. public and it was here in hollywood at this mexican restaurant i think it was called candle house or candelarias on sunset interesting and it was with bad religion and jfa holy shit and then, a real show and then a three of our local bands from southern california and there was a cat that we his, his name is uh, scott french he had a you know, scott french he had a company called silver voice productions okay. so he has golden voice oh, and now you got shit. a silver voice so it was his show and uh we were supposed to go on first. So I'm a killer. Nobody's there. No one's going to see us if we mm-hmm. sound horrible or whatever. So we get there. We're, you know, the, the, we're at the club early yeah. and all that stuff. The other band goes, one of the other bands go on first. And we're just oh, like, shit. okay, cool. One, the drummer's mom, <laughs> Joey and Naya, the drummer's mom is like yelling for our band while the other bands are playing. And they're like, oh, all friends. Man. We're like, oh, shh, you know, like, hey, you know, like, come on. <laughs> I think she's the one who videoed it. Super actually, mom fan, yeah, yeah, super mom fan. Okay, we're next. Okay, it's not that full yet. No, we're not next. We're on after these guys. Yeah. And by the time we go on, the place is packed. And I'm just Shit. like, this ain't even happening. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, wow. I only played a backyard. Practiced incessantly. Three, two, three times a week. Damn. Would drive from, from uh, let's say, San Juan Capistrano to Anaheim to a rehearsal studio. Yeah. Three times a week. Practice, 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 yeah. practice, practice. We do the show. It's it's awesome. I, I guess they liked it. Kids are just flying. I, I always, you know, I would move to anything, even if I didn't know who it was. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so everybody's just going bananas. And I was like, that's cool. That's okay. That's the end of the show. I was like, man, that's that felt sick because like people totally. were totally into it. And then, yeah. and then I would that, love to see us in front, man. I would love and, to see that. And then that's it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, came, it came and went, you know, and it was super funny. And it was super, it was cool. Like, you know, we don't, we didn't know shit. We didn't, 
carried on. What was the band called again? Fourth Degree. <laughs> Fourth Degree. <laughs> yeah. It was it was a band before I got there. Oh, okay. I just walked in as a singer. So it was like, you know, they were already. Hey, it's first time singing in a band? Ever. Anything. Wow, man. Only time singing in a band. <laughs> Are you screaming and stuff or no? Kind of. Little, like one of my favorite bands and still one of my favorite bands back then is Blast. Okay. From Santa Cruz. Yeah, great And so, fans. you know, there was no... Let's say there was no real singing, but there wasn't just guttural cries or anything yeah. like that. You know, he had, it definitely had its tones and stuff. Yeah. And we, we had all the influences from Leeway, wow. Cro-Mags, Ludacrist, just funny stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so we just kind of, uh, that's what I like. You know <clears> what yeah. I mean? We, we all like it, sick of it all. We liked, we liked everything. Everything that was coming out, we got it, you know, yeah. in some one way or another. Metal, metal shit too. But we, we weren't metal, but like mm-hmm. it was just like, you know, we, the group of, People that that grew up with, like the parties, like it's in San Juan Capuchano, it's punks, cholos, yeah, skinheads, yeah. meddlers, like everything. You know what I mean? And we just wanted to party. Yeah, you know, it, it would never, it never turned into a thing. You know, it's, it's kind of like fun. Kind of like when we were like punk rock was never, was never one thing. You know, yeah. like what kind of band is that? Like I don't know. It's just a band. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you know, like it was punk band. You know, you know, the first time I heard Chrome Eggs, my buddy brought me the tape from New York. He got it. Damn. And I was like, oh, this stuff's fucking rad. What is it? Mm-hmm. And then I got the record. I'm like, that's not the same. <laughs> it had to grow on me. Yeah. But I had the tape and I was like, but it's still, you know, then now, you know, I just kind of, okay, you get some production and it just yeah. sounds sick. And you're just like, they slowed it down a little, just mm-hmm. a little bit. And you're just like, oh, okay. Well, how'd you find out about the New York Harker stuff, being like a West Coast kid? Well, you know, Flipside Magazine, Max oh, Rock right. and Roll, they had ads, you know, as right. stuff. My buddy, Max Rock and Roll, too. buddy of mine, uh, Stuart Liu, he went to New York and he brought okay. back just all this stuff, you know what I mean? From <laughs> Carnivore, Nuclear Assault, oh, yeah. Stormtroopers of Death, like just, I just, I mean, he just brought every, the Chrome Mag, like all, shit back then. all yeah. these things, you know, and people are just yeah. like, oh, where did you get this? Where did you get this stuff? And I'm like, oh, yeah. dude, my friend brought it back for me, you know, and like he was, the, he was the metal dude. He had hair down to his ass and he was this Chinese Damn. guy that go to shows with us, you know. Did you have long hair too back then? No, no, no. no not long. It, you know, it, it had enough where it would flip out of the back of a baseball hat, but it never, <laughs> never, never long, you know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you know, so that was... Did you already tell me your first show, right? Your first Harker show, or punk show? You remember what it was? <sighs> Were you like, trying, holy shit, I'm trying to think it was I want to be part of this shit. Like, this ex- is like, it's either Exploited or the Subhumans at that Olympic Auditorium. Damn. You know what I mean? It was just... And you're talking like... Three, That's a big venue, too. 3,000 people. I know. It's crazy. It's not like that. It's crazy. So then, too, and it wasn't... There were sections that you would go sit, so... South Orange County had a section that you could find all your friends sitting in this area. That's interesting. You know, so everybody like, hey, God, we'll see you the we'll see you the corner, okay, or whatever. Yeah, sure. So we go there and you catch up with everybody. Hey, yeah, what's up? You know what I mean? You didn't. No you phones all, back there. No. See you at the show next Friday, and then all of a sudden you're at the show next Friday. And then yeah, you, simple crazy, as simple man. as that. You know, fighting for your place in the car, someone's car. Like, oh, I already I pitched it 10 bucks, you know what I mean, yeah, for gas. Like, yes. I, I got to see. You can go fuck yourself, you know, whatever, you know, so. Was it crazy violent back then, too? <laughs> yeah. It's not crazy violent now, not compared to how it used to be. It was scary back then, especially a little kid, I'm sure. But you know what? It was scary, but, like. You felt safe there, I, too, But right? I never, I never got, was involved with anything that got me to that point. Totally. You know, I remember, what, like, I thought it was the first show or second show. We, uh, our little area was next to this wall that had this hallway that went to the floor. Yeah. And I remember hearing this crazy ass commotion and I looked down and there's this like punk rock Viking chick with braids down to her butt swinging around a fire extinguisher. Damn. And I'm just like, this chick is nuts. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, and she'd take out any one of us. And I'm just looking down at this. She's taking on like, I don't even know if there were girls or guys or whatever, but it was just Holy this melee shit. and she was just in the middle of it. And I was like, Phew. Oh God! You know like, <laughs> this. You know this is way, way out. There's a liquor store around the corner that would sell to you pretty much to your height. Not wow. They never asked for ID, but if you looked like you were ten years mm-hmm. old, like you get the fuck out of here, kid. But you know, you just yeah. walk in. You're twelve. You get your six pack of bud and just walk away. You know, I mean, they didn't give a rat shit. It's like escape from New York down there. You know, what yeah. I mean? Until the cops came for a couple riots, and that was just, just you know. You could call it a bunch of misunderstandings, but 
You know, it's the early 80s. They got all these like, TV specials like Punk, Have You Lost Your Kid? And like yeah. all these things, you know. It was on Chips, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I don't know if you that Chips episode, you know. And they filmed that, like, at the Starwood and, like, the old clubs. Clubs that I didn't go to, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, how scary it was. And that's, like, early, early 80s, you know what I mean? These kids are possessed. Yeah, you know, and it's all <laughs> this misunderstanding thing. You know, and it's yeah. all like what you don't know, you fear type totally. situation. You know, and I did not come from a broken home. Mm-hmm. I came from a hardworking set of Loving parents, family, yeah. middle class family that loved me and like, totally. you know, wanted the best for me, maybe babied me a little too much. But that's where I came from, you know, and I loved my friends. Yeah. So I didn't fit that genre. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Or, or what everybody was saying on the TVs like, and stuff like that. And you know all this man? kind of shit. Like, no, nah, man, they give me a ride of the show. Yeah. Why would I say? Why would I say fuck my parents? You know, I what love I mean? my mom. You know, I mean, she I, dropped you know, me off here. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, yeah, I, I, like I, it I, I think about that now to this day. Like, she didn't have to do this. Yeah, and she did it. You know what I mean? And she yeah. called, and like you know she did everything she could. Called my cousin, see what's going on. Like blah 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 blah. Yeah, you know, like she wanted to know what's going on. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, most parents don't know what's going on. They don't. And they don't care to find out. They don't. It's crazy. You know? Like I pride myself now as an adult knowing things, like I going through these things and like, you know, oh, you want to go somewhere? Let me look into it. You know, oh, what are you going to look into? I'm going to look into what kind of places. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to look. And now it's easy. You can look it on your phone. You don't even have to leave your it's house. so easy. But, you know, back then, you know, when my mom pulled up and saw all these motherfuckers on the street, she was like, oh, oh. I, I thought she was going to drive away and kidnap us back home. You know what yeah. I mean? She was just like, what is going on? But she trusted here? you. And- my buddy's like laying in the back seat with his mohawks and wouldn't band. Like, you know, we're just, wow. just like, this isn't happening. So it was just maybe a phase. Yeah, she thought it was. Like, if you would have <laughs> told me then that I would still be listening to the first GBH album at 50, I would have laughed at you. That's great. You know what I mean? And so yeah. I still have my hits every week, yeah. almost the same time, like religion, like I want to hear this record again. That's crazy. You know, so. And that it, with Gimme Fire Fire? You know, no, it was Leather Bristles, Studs okay. and Acne, you know, but just, it's just funny, like, you know, like this job of tattooing, like it's, it's pretty unreal. A, what I can do for people, what people have done for yeah. me, what it's enabled me to do, but. The fact that I can pretty much dress however I want, yeah, you're I, boss. Al- almost act however I want. Business is business. You got to learn at some point if you're going to be in business, you have to grow up and learn a little bit about business. Yeah, so you got to learn how to talk to people. You got, especially yeah. in this thing where you're just exchanging blood and you're right next to somebody. Yeah, you know, you're breathing on each other. That's true. You gotta, you gotta figure stuff out. You know, some people don't have to. You know, but maybe they're not as busy as I am. You yeah. know what I mean? But like, I like my customers until I don't. Until mm-hmm. they do something or say something that's just utterly unforgivably stupid, you know, I'll give yeah. them all the benefit of the doubt. And that doesn't happen often, yeah. if at all. But, uh, you know, if you would have told me, like, if I, if I would told my parents, like, you're not going to believe I'm going to be doing this for 30 years and I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to have <laughs> my my life taken care of and a happy wife and a good yeah. a couple good kids and grandkids. And, uh, you know, I go, from this? They would have... <laughs> And still going to these weird shows, please. And you know what I mean, please. Yeah, you know they would they would laugh you out of the, out of the room, but yeah, here we are. <laughs> when yeah, when did you realize it was a career and it wasn't just something you were like interested in? And I'm gonna try to tattoo, but who knows where it's gonna get me? When I realized it was a career is when I stopped looking for something else to do, which yeah. was pretty much immediately. Okay, you know, like I started tattooing, I loved it. I loved the guy who got me my first job. Mm-hmm. The people I was meeting, still hanging out with, new friends, my old friends were all into it. Maybe yeah. they didn't all get tattooed, but the minute I realized, like, I'm not looking like, you know, you have a job at UPS. It was a great job. I, I want to do something else, you know, but I don't know what to do. I was going to college, and then yeah. I, I quit going to college. The minute I quit going to college, they said they were only going to promote people who had college degrees. And I'm oh, just wow. like, oh, Jesus Christ. You know what I mean? I was just massaging yeah. cardboard. At a certain time rate and doing okay, yeah. and I thought I could just carry that. And some people did carry that into upper management, mm-hmm. but now they put a okay. We're going to stop that. Now you have to have a degree. Now you have to give us something to offer us for the full time experience. Yeah. Ugh. But then, I, <laughs> but, then, but then I started tattooing, and uh, then I got my job, and that was it. I was like, I wasn't trying to move to different studios. I got offered jobs at other studios. I got, yeah. You know, it was, you moved around a little bit later on, bl- but yeah. You know, after I got some chops up, I got invited to San Diego. Yeah. Now, I lived there for like seven years and worked at Avalon Tattoo. With That's right. This uh, Fip and Patty Kelly at the time were just 
the best bosses ever. Awesome. You know, and that and I started traveling to conventions a lot there. Yeah. Traveled to Japan the first time there. I remember hanging out with you in Japan. We played. That's there. why. That's <laughs> yeah. Right. And then. Uh, it's awesome. And uh, I went to Amsterdam for the first time, working there in '95. Like, worked with Hanky Panky, you know, for, say, for a he month. Was a legend over there, yeah. Yeah, still a legend over there. But you know, it's a it's a total different time now. You know what I mean? But man, the shit that I've seen, just kind of like whoa. Yeah, it's been amazing. You know. Do you remember working on your portfolio and stuff like that? You know, I mean, I just. You know, before I knew anything about photography, you know, it was a gamble. I take these pictures, like, you know, I take like four pictures of a tattoo, maybe one would come out okay. And you're like, fuck, all right. So, so Hendrix, that, Hendrix was saying that too. You take multiple pictures of it. And that's the one that goes in your book, you yeah. know. And then the magazine, the, so like what we have now on Instagram, the magazine Crazy. was a big hit. But you send your pictures into the magazine, like everybody else's, you might get it in there three months later. Damn. Then after three months, by the time you, by the time your picture comes out in a magazine and distributed in people's hands, you're onto some other shit. Yeah, you're way or, better too. Or you're or you're way better. Or the general population is into something else. Mm. So here you are, like just trying to get these photos in magazines and trying, but you know, you just always tried. Did you get yours in there? Yeah, yeah, here and there, you know what awesome. I mean? So it, that was a big it, it accomplishment. Worked. I thought it was, everybody I think thought it was yeah. them. Like, oh, dude, I'm in the magazine, you know, because they wouldn't, they wouldn't tell you or you just showed up in the magazine. Wow. You know, like, so you have to buy the magazine to find out if you're in the magazine. And nobody's emailing you or texting you or nothing. <laughs> no, nothing at all. <laughs> you had to subscribe to that shit to get it. That's crazy. Pretty much. Or go to the local, you know, newsstand. Yeah. Because they were big back then. There was only like three or four magazines tops. Mm -hmm. There was Easy Rider Biker magazine. There was International Tattoo Magazine. Was it Outlaw Biker? It, it was uh, along the same family. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Outlaw, I think they had like a tattoo. I think it was part of the same Easy Rider family. Yeah. Um, and then there was, I think there was a couple from Europe that were all that maintained their bigness, if you will, yeah. you know, or like, you know, their power of uh, just sheer volume and a reaching like, you know, like Easy Rider Tattoo was in every country in yeah. the United States. So, you know, it had some pull to it for yeah. sure. It's, what, do you, what do you think it was, like, the the attraction and the addiction to getting tattooed for you? You know, I got it. I'm with my buddy that we used to go to tattoo shops all the time. I didn't have one. So we're in this tattoo shop in San Diego called Tattoo Land. There's one in Anaheim. Yeah. And uh, it just overcame me. I'm going to get one today. And so he was at the other end of the shop, and I started talking to the artist. And I go, I want this kanji. He's like, yeah, how much? He's like, oh, yeah, 40 bucks. I'm like, how do you put a circle around it? All right, 50 bucks. I'm like, <laughs> I want to do it. He's like, okay. So he's setting up. And me and my buddy are talking in the room, but not like next to each other. Just like kind of, not yeah. yelling, but this is big enough. And so he's like, come on back. He puts the stencil on. And I'm still kind of talking to my buddy through a half door. Yeah. And so he lays me down. He pulls my arm back. And hear the machine go off. And my buddy's like, hey, dude, if someone's getting tattooed, let's check it out. And he comes to the half door. And he looks at me in horror. And he's like, Oh my God, your mom's gonna kill me. And then she's gonna fucking kill you. Like, are you out of your fucking? And he's like, and he's like lecturing me over this thing. And I'm like, I couldn't take it anymore. I had to get one. Holy and from the shit. minute I the minute that needle hit my skin, it didn't hurt. It okay. didn't do everything was all right. I was like, this is the shit. I was just so the thing the size of a too, the yeah. thing the size of a half dollar piece, dude. I thought I had Arnold Schwarzenegger arms after I got this thing done, and mm -hmm. it's under my arm. You know yeah. what I mean? So I got to do the oh, check it out, oh, man. man. <laughs> you know what I mean? So awesome. you know, and that was the beginning. And I was like, I'm getting another one, and I'm getting another one. And I never even showed my mom till I was like almost one whole chest thing covered, and Holy she was just like, Oh, what the fuck are you doing? She's so pissed. She was pissed, but I'm like, Oh, I'm sorry. Like, I had to do it. You know, wow. like, and you know, and the, you know, with the throwing it back in her face, like I didn't quit school yet. <laughs> I didn't, you know, I didn't jump off some drug addict deep end thing. Yeah, you know, you didn't even know I had. It. I've had these things for a year, and she wow. was just kind of like, kind of not ate her words. Was kind of like, oh, I guess. That's you got some uh, points. You know, so yeah. Were you a party kid or no? Yeah, I like the party. I mean, the whole crew liked the party. Yeah, I went through like stints where I didn't drink for like a year here. Back at it, you're there, back at it. Yeah. Like, just here and there, you know what I mean? But yeah, we party. We you know, we would go to we go to house parties, we go to shows, we do, you know, all these random things, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we had a pretty close knit group of people, you know. I remember sitting in my truck one night in the pouring rain in front of my buddy's house, went to a house party, was bunk, left, we got a twelve pack, <laughs> and me and four dudes just jumped in the back of my truck with a shell and 
smoked cigarettes and talked and wow. all night long. All yeah. night long. Like the sun was coming up. Like, oh, dude, I got to get the fuck out of here. Like, you know, it's six in the morning. Yeah. We've been having the best time chopping it up in a driveway in the rain. It's awesome. You know what I mean? Just so hanging. just hanging, you know? Like, so if there's four of us. This is three beers a piece. No one's drunk. Mm-hmm. We're just cruising, you know what yeah. I mean? Talking about life, you know? Like, yeah. Something out of a TV show, you know? Yeah. It's fucking cool. So when you started tattooing in other countries, that must have been like a crazy high feel. Like I'm flying to this country and I'm going to tattoo over there. Yeah. I went, my dad took me to the airport to go to Amsterdam, oh, which shit. was the first place I went. How old you then? then? How old you then? You remember? I think it was 25. Okay. And uh, I had 100 bucks to my name. And my dad's like, oh, like, because I gotten, I was making tattoo machines, so I put all my money into some parts, and I all making this and that. And my dad's like, Dude, you only got a hundred bucks. You're going to this, you're going to a whole different <laughs> side of the world. I'm like, hey, you know what though, dad? Like, one thing a a buddy told me that if you go somewhere with no money, you have to make money. True. Simple it's as that. Point, and, and I've gone places with money, not to show, just I had money, so I just took it with me. Yeah. And it was the worst convention ever. So I just like it, it. It's true. So I go. I don't care, Dad. I'm going. And then so we're waiting to get on the board plane, and then they they call out like, "Oh, we've overbooked it." Like if someone gives up their seat, we'll give them a voucher for the next day and five hundred bucks and all these things. And my dad's all, "Hey, man, that sounds like a really good deal to me." And I'm like, "I'm getting on this fucking plane one way or another. I don't give a fuck who can't get on it. I'm getting on it. I have yeah. a ticket. I don't even believe I'm going, Dad." So yeah. So get out there. It's when you can still smoke on planes. I go, I go, I go, in, I go in the back of the smoking area, and there's this Japanese. We had some turbulence. He is white knuckling it and just lighting cigarette butt to butt, like. Damn. And I was like, man, this fool is just. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and so I just had one or two, and this guy was just like one lighting one after another, so shook, and yeah. I was just like, wow. Land in Amsterdam, give him the address. And even though Hanky Panky told me I could take the train, which would have been super cheaper, but I, go, I yeah. don't care. Just get me there because I had some. St- I had a bunch of stuff with me. I get there, and uh, the lady on the the lady cab driver was like, "Oh, starting early, huh?" I'm like, "No, no, I'm gonna go work there." She's like, oh, "Sure you are, mm. sure you are." So the tattoo shops in the heart is in the dead center of district. the red light district. Yeah, the apartment is two doors down from the shop. So and you never see shit like that. In here, life, here yeah. I'm living, gonna live for a month and a half. Wow. With Freddie Corbin and this other guy, Dandelion. He has a shop in, I think it's Idaho, Yankee Doodle Dandy. But mm-hmm. he, they were there before me. So we we're all going to share this apartment. And uh, he had just arrived from New York, and I just arrived from Los Angeles yeah. or San Diego, you know, via. And so he, he's walking down the street when the cab pulls up. Oh, let's put your stuff upstairs, Freddie. Put my stuff upstairs. And I kind of sat down for a second. I'm like, all right, let me, I'm here. You know, <laughs> I don't even know what to think about it. Yeah. And he goes, okay, I'm going to go down the shop for a little bit because it opens at 11. You know, it's like 11 yeah. 15. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna just wash my face. Oh, there's no water here, here yet. Like the hot, they had, they had like the infinite hot water thing, you know. What I mean, yeah. but for some reason it wasn't hooked up. It got hooked up like a day later. I'm Damn. like, all right. So I walk downstairs, and I'm just on this street. It's called Adenzeit's Vurgeval. It's, it's one of the streets in the red light yeah. canal. There, it's quiet. And I close the door to the apartment. I lock it, and I'm standing there just soaking it in. Like, fuck, I am in fucking Amsterdam. Like, this it's is the crazy. shit. And then out of the, out of the quiet, just the guitar chords of "I Want to Be Your Dog" like loud in the street, yeah. and I'm like, "What?" It still gives me chills to this day. And so there was a bar above the tattoo shop called the Other Place. Okay, they're blaring it, so it's like my own soundtrack to a movie. And, yeah. and, and there's it's quiet on the street. Yeah. So this I'm walking towards the tattoo shop, which is only 50 feet away, with this intro. <laughs> and I'm just thinking, going like, this trip is gonna be crazy. Like I, I just right then yeah. I was like, oh, buckle up, because it, <laughs> it, it, it ain't gonna be like you know you're never gonna get anything like this. Mm-hmm. And well, I didn't. You know that yeah. was to this day one of the most epic voyages ever in the history of ever. I'm going there, yeah. You know what I mean? That. Just yeah. Just you're single too. too? Much. Yes, I was, oh, yeah, <laughs> which is pretty pretty banana. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Twenty five years old, no, yeah. living in Amsterdam for how many? A month, a and, month a half? and a half. Wow, dude. Yeah, were you in contact with your parents? Obviously, yeah. I call I, my ex girlfriend. She broke up with me as I was going, she, oh, and her shit. thing is, like, I want you to go have a good time and not have anything on your conscience. That's nice. 
Yeah, that's cool. So I invited a girl to come meet me out there. <laughs> like, like, you know, well, why do I have to suffer? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and uh, it was, you know, it was great. You know, it, it was just a great start to finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bananas. So then he came back, and then we were you working when he came back? I still at Avalon. Okay. You know, they met me out. It was a gigantic convention at this, what used to be the stock exchange in Amsterdam. It was right across the street from the train station, central station. Yeah. Epic, international everybody was there everybody was partying like it yeah. was insane it was so much fun and just just the best like just laid groundwork for yeah. a lifetime of friends you know like you don't get yeah. that opportunity that often you know yeah um so then you've been tattooing for a, a good amount of time then and then um where, where, where did i meet you at originally do you remember i thought it was japan okay that was the first time we met i guess yeah I thought and it was because Gabby, somehow Gabby, oh, yeah, Gabby. Gabby saw, like, oh, so first I'm uh, tattooing at the shop in Nagoya. It was in Nagoya. Okay. And so all oh, these guys are playing, you know, oh, wait, 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 was it Nagoya? Or was it, what year was, was that? Tokyo? That was like, one of the first times you went there, I think you saw it too, 96, 97? It was 97. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure it was Nagoya. It was Nagoya. But prior to that, Peter and the Test Tube Babies were playing there. There's a record store right next to the tattoo shop, Killer the most epic killer record store ever <laughs> is next to Tattoo Shop, punk rock stuff. Okay. So there's a flyer for Peter and Tattoo Babies. And I'm like, we got to go. I saw these guys at the Olympic. God knows when. Yeah. I'll buy everybody a ticket. I show up to the show. They're fucking $50 a ticket then. Damn. And I'm just like, oh, uh, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> it was like six of us. Oh, man. And I, I said. Fuck. And so it was so a little anecdote on that show. Like, Good so show, though? It was awesome. It, I guess the night before, this dude was drinking, like, I don't know, some kind of, like, rainbow-colored drinks that just he was puking all morning. So he was, like, a pile of shit that, the night before. Damn. So now, this show, insane. It's so much fun. And, like, it, you know, it, everybody's singing along. Like, the Japanese guys don't know the words. They're just singing along. Yeah. It's a total oi show. Like, <laughs> Japanese oi bands opening up for him. Sick. And so we go, to, they invite us to go party with them afterwards. So we're walking down the street, and Peter from Peter the Tattoo Babies grabs a bike and starts riding it, just because nothing's locked in the streets, right? You're in Japan. Then, no. Dude, the most hardcore dude with the fucking three foot tall mohawk is bugging out, like, oh, uh, say my son, like, no, 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 no. Jaina's standing in front of the guy with the bike, like, mm. Peter with the bike, like, you can't take the bike. And he just rides around, and I'm like, fuck it. That's so, so we go like three, four blocks. He just dump, jumps, dumps the bike. Mohawk guy hops on the bike, takes it back to where it was. Puts in the spot, man. I, so I, respectful. And I was here. just like, oh, like, damn. Because this dude, you know, for all I know, he had like, fuck the police, painted on his jacket, you know, yeah. but he's taking somebody's poor that, bike that, that back to That sums up the whole Japanese culture back then, too. Mm -hmm. like, to, still. Yeah, not wear even, the mask you know. when they're sick. There's no graffiti on the trains. Everybody's respectful. They fucking when in between songs, they stay quiet so you can say something. <laughs> that is the funniest shit when they stay <laughs> quiet. They're super <laughs> quiet. Or that sometimes they would bow to me before they die, like it before they dived. It's fucking crazy, man. So you saw one of our first shows there. It was yeah. fucking crazy there. It man. was a lot of fun. Who you give it a cocoa bat or yeah. Coke, yeah, it was cocoa bat? You guys are like or not cokehead hipster. No, it was that was later on. It was later on. But <laughs> just like this I saw this band there one year and it was they're called Star Club. It was like the Japanese clash. Wow. And dude, like everybody like but the same thing between song it was quiet. Yeah. You know, and the guy would like mutter some stuff and then go into another song. I was like what the fuck? It was crazy. Weird. You'd had to you'd have to sell your t-shirts for like thirty five to forty dollars back then. When t-shirts in America like ten, twelve, fifteen bucks at a show, but that's the prices you sold your shit for. It was crazy, yeah, man. Yeah. We were selling work shirts that we got for like five dollars from Dogwood Printing in New Jersey. Shout out to Maddie Boy for like fifty dollars a work shirt, dude. Or like Moon and us, we brought old hardcore shirts and we all put them up on the wall and sold our old shirts. It was a whole different world there, man. It was. Yep. It was awesome though. Like it was pretty rad. Like just a, to, from going to shows in the United States, yeah, and a lot of them all over the place. Even when I was in Amsterdam, went to a bunch of shows out there. Like at fairly large clubs, the Paradiso. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Song. Um, Milkveg, Milkveg, yeah, Amsterdam, and uh, Paradiso Milkveg. And then there's some other random weird club. You know, saw these random shows the whole month and a half I was there. Like saw yeah. Dick Dale at the Paradiso. It was kind of funny. Sick. Like. We were walking through there with Hawaiian shirts, like everybody's just dressed in black, you know. And then there's like yeah. random Californians with Hawaiian shirts walking through the crowd, like, 
You know, I go, why would you wear that shirt? It's so loud. I'm like, it's Dick Dale. Yeah. Don't you know who the fuck Dick Dale is? Man, I know he's wearing a leather jacket and a headband, but that guy's the king of surf, so I don't know yeah. what the fuck you're talking about, but I, I'm wearing my Hawaiian shirt here. Like, <laughs> you know, like, fuck. The different cultures. So I watched the whole thing the other day about the Latino lowrider culture in Japan. It's insane. Dude, like I, how saw, they... I saw that in 97. Yeah. It's, not, it's nothing new. It's I, not. So I'm at this tattoo shop in Nagoya. It was called Eccentric, and the tattooer's name was Sabado. So we're hanging out front. Streets are small. Here comes this 59 bubble top Impala on three wheels coming around the corner in 97. Damn. And I was like, what? And, he, and, you know, it's funny. He told his friends, yeah, come by. You know, we got this American tattoo. He'd love to see your car. Like, they always told their friends. Like, they were, the friends were intrigued. Oh, what's he like? You know, well, just come on down. You know, yeah. bring your, you know, this dude, you know, on three wheels making this corner. You know what I mean? I'm like, what is that? Down the street is a Yakuza gambling house. And there's dudes, like, washing S classes with no shirts covered in tattoos and i'm just trying to figure out how to take a picture without them noticing me you know and i'm like damn oh, you're just seeing all this stuff and you know in japan like this is way out out here you know like yeah what's crazy we used to go to go to the hotel hotels and you couldn't go in the pool if you had tattoos yeah it was weird because same it's thing it's still it, there there are there too. are designated spas pools hot springs where they really just don't care it's not okay. like that you know they, they don't care if you're tattooed they've accepted either the Yakuza or they accepted the fact that there's more people than Yakuza that have tattoos. Yeah, because back then, it but wasn't that time, it wasn't really They like don't. They, my, my buddy met me out there once where I was shooting a book. He met me out there in Osaka, and he jumped in the pool, and someone was trying to stop him. And they, oh, he just like, oh, hey, it's cool, man. Don't worry about it. He just like stepped around him and jumped in the pool. The pool was closed. They drained the fucking thing. No way. Yes. Dude. At like a Swiss hotel in Osaka. Like, but why is that you can't go in the water if you're not part of that? They just don't. It's you Do know. You think your people are dirty with tattoos? Or? Yes. Anything you say, yes. Mm. It's just, you know, it's not my culture. I don't know. Old people don't give a shit if you have tattoos in Japan. Like really old people now. Yeah. Young people don't care. It's the it's the age in between mm. that people are kind of like, well, oh, you know, maybe like let's say probably like sixty to seventy five now, or sixty to seventies. Maybe they're the ones kind of like looking at you, like so you're they think you're more. affiliated with yeah. They but that but that's just what they've been taught, and that's just know, what they know. It has nothing to yeah. do with the the Japanese kids got so many gnarly tattoos, and they go all the way like right now. Neck, you mean, head, yeah. melon, face, whatever the fuck. They don't give now, a fuck right? now. Yeah, you know, back then, not so much. You yeah, know, but it was it was gonna go that way if, yeah. as, soon, as soon as other people were making it hip or whatever. Yeah, that's making it safe. Well, no, I wouldn't say making it safe. Okay, just you know, it's a style. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a certain style look. You know what I mean? I have tons of friends that have tattoos on their faces. You know True. what I mean? I, it's not my thing. I like it. You know what I mean? I think my favorite face tattoo is on Frank Carter. From Frank Carter and the Rattlesnakes. Yeah, what's and the you got, what's you got? It's just an upside down cross. Like, yeah, like I love a, it. Yeah. Like, like a skinhead looking upside down on, his, on the side of his eye. I know exactly what you're talking about. It looks and dope. when he got it, I was like, oh, dude, that is hard. It's a good look. You're AF. Right. I was like, that. And he's covered and he he's tattoos. A cool kid, man. But I saw that and I was talking with him. Like, that looks tough. That just the lone cross, like Phew, you win. And I was like, damn. <laughs> do you have any problems with people just getting their hands in their face first? I talk. I, you know Not what? Problems, but you try to give I, advice. I, no, I definitely try to talk them out. They don't need it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I go, look, dude, I'm I'm a tattooer. You anyway, know, you might not gonna be, you're not gonna become a tattooer. My sale now. I tell people is like, listen, I don't know what you're gonna be doing in five years, but I know everybody I or meet. Five months. Or, you know, you could go that fast. I know everybody I meet. If I'm doing business, I'm trying to shake somebody's hand. Right. So that's the first thing I'm going to look at. The neck, I don't care so much about. I look at people's hands. It tells me a lot. After 30 years of tattooing almost, and even working manual labor and UPS, yeah. like, I could tell if you work with your hands or not. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so if I'm, looking, if I'm telling a customer this story, I'm like, listen, you don't work with your hands. You do something else. So unless, you know, like it's going to... People are going to notice that off the bat. Yeah. So one thing you cannot buy is anonymity ever. Good point. You know what I mean? So if you someday just want to not be recognized, it ain't going to happen True. with your hands tattooed. You know, you're not going to be, yeah. you're not going to be, you know, OJ Simpson wearing gloves, you know, in a white Word. Bronco. You're going to, you know, <laughs> uh, you're, you're going to have this on your hand. Yeah. Like I'm committed to this, you know what I mean? So that's all. It's just wow, you know. I don't, I don't have anything offensive on my hand. You know, yeah, like, me either. It's, you know, whatever. Do what you got want to do, but yeah, 
you know, if you're going to come in a tattoo shop and just get your hands and your neck tattooed, we made fun of that already 10 years ago. We called it, it was like the warped to a bodysuit. Body <laughs> you know what I mean? So, Scarfs and jeans, yeah. Now, in England, a lot of old timers would have a tattoo on their forearm. Maybe just one, maybe one on each forearm, you know. And I remember the bullshit I had to go to my mom and dad to get a tattoo, right? So I'd ask them, like, oh, you know, why'd you get on your forearm first? And then I, every answer was the same. Like, oh, why the fuck am I going to get it where I can't see it? True. You know what I mean? So I, I, you know, I took a beating from my mom and dad, but I got what I wanted. Exactly. They, they, they went in with that mentality. Like, I'm going to get roughed up, but I'm going to have the tattoo on my forearm, and I'm going to be stoked. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to be the cock of the walk showing this thing off as I'm cruising around town. Yeah. So you don't have to get your hand tattooed. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, there's people who will do it. I hope they're good. I hope you get what you want. But, you know, I don't have to do it. And I've had people try, you know, oh, I'll give you more money. I'll do this. I'm like, you know what? I don't need your money. I don't need, I don't need this headache. Personally, yeah. Because I'm going to go home and think about why the fuck did this kid get this thing on his forearm? Like, I honestly, I honestly don't care about the neck. It's the hands that really. Bother you more than the face, huh? Well, face, you know, like. I haven't had many requests of people with no tattoos wanting something on their face. It's been more like, you know, they already have some shit on their face. Like, okay, I'll do, you know, want something smaller? Sure. That's yeah. fine. When I started tattooing in 92, this Mexican dude walked into the shop at Classic. Looked like a little ranchero man. Had a button-down shirt, clean cut, jeans, work boots, but he was older. You know, he was walking like not, not limping, but he had the old man walk. Looked like the guy from Up. Okay, so oh, yeah. <laughs> imagine the dude from Up, Mexican, gotcha. with a, like a, like a regular cowboy hat. Sick, okay, got gotcha. you. He comes in, takes off his fucking hat, and his face is just tattooed, forehead, everything. And I was like, whoa. And he had gotten tattooed by all the old guys at the Pike in Long Beach, like all the historic dudes. Like, and he was already probably in his close to late 60s at this point. He was when covered, he came, his body was covered. Covered. You know what I mean? And I'm just like, holy shit. It's like if my dad walked in, just totally covered. Yeah. I did a little something on his cheek, and he was still getting tattooed. You did something on his cheek? Yeah, I wish I would remember that guy's name. Eric tattooed a bunch of stuff on him. Like, I wish I remember his name, because that was, to me, when he came in, like, I'd seen pictures of tattooed face so guys. Whole face tattooed. You know, there was that guy, Mike, from New York, uh, the Coney Island Mike. You oh, know? yeah. You know, he's, he passed, you know, God yes. rest his soul, too, but... You know, like you see that when you're coming up in tattoo, and you see the great Omi, you see this yeah. guy named Jack Dracula, who was from Coney Island also, or, or somewhere in New York. You know, all these New York guys had these, yeah. you know, they always had these weird dudes hanging out that would get whacked out tattoos, and you'd, they'd, you'd do them on them. Yeah. So here's this old Mexican cat, rolls into Fullerton, you know, like Orange County, boom, you know. Like I, got, I used to get pulled over by cops in Mission Viejo when I first started getting tattooed, and I only had one like half sleeve. And because I'd be my driver arm driving oh, on the street, yeah. pull me over. Roused me and let me go. And in Mission Viejo, there's all sheriffs. Started working at UPS. Went to this little bar down the street from my high school, which I actually just stayed by, called uh-huh. Sh- called Shooters. And so now we're all in shirts, shirts and ties, done with work at UPS. We get off like a tan. I go, let's go to Shooters, have a couple beers, play some pool. Yeah. Here they come, all these sheriffs, wasted. And I'm just like, ugh. And I recognize two of them. I'm like, really? Yeah, but I'm in a shirt and tie. Damn. With a bunch of other dudes in a shirt and tie. Yeah. So finally, this dude comes up. like, man, you look familiar. You know? And I'm just <laughs> like, yeah, you pulled me over two nights ago. Or two days ago. He's like, oh, I did? What did I, get? did I give you a ticket? And I'm like, no. He's like, why did I pull you over? And I'm like, I don't know. I have tattoos on this arm. Maybe you pulled me over for tattoos. And I saw it and I was like, oh, I remember. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. But that's all he said, you know what I mean? Not, you know, but he was like, he was right, kind of yeah. junk, you know, and he was up next to the pool table. We played pool, never got pulled over again. Interesting. You know what I mean? It was, you know, because he saw you were a nice person. But, well, no, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a dark skinned Mexican kid yeah. tattoo. is like maybe one of the first in Mission Viejo again, you know, like, and driving up and down Mission Viejo, like the whole town yeah. of Mission Viejo. So, you know, it wasn't like it was stark, but it was like, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of, that yeah, there wasn't a lot of white kids in Mission Viejo with tattoos, much less yeah. Mexican kids with tattoos. So it's crazy because now, like I said, like my UPS man has a tattoo. The guys at Trader Joe's have sleeves and eyelids done at my spot over here. I mean, like six years ago, maybe I went and applied for UPS. I was going to try to get a job there during Christmas rush, and I already had my neck tats, and I went there and they hired me. Mm-hmm. But then I got a tour the next week and I didn't do it. But I, I just want to see if I could actually do it. And they would actually hire me. They would. So yeah. So do you think that? This is the main topic I've been bringing up to all the tattooers so far I've on the podcast. Do you think the TV shows helped that make them more acceptable? 
that's a, a really good positive thing. They made it more acceptable to Joe Schmo on the street or like an old lady or something. Because now like families are getting tattooed together. T- people with tattoos aren't looked at like pieces of shit all the time anymore. Do you think that TV show exposed it to be like just normal people are getting tattooed? Exposed is a good word. Yeah. Families have always been getting tattooed together. You know, so if there's more families getting tattooed because of TV shows, possibly. But just expose it to, like, it's not just, here's people telling their stories about why they're going to tattoo, that somebody died in their family, or their dog died, or this. So you think that you think the TV shows help the tattoo community, at the same time hurt the tattoo community? Here's the thing. See, it's, I'm going to say, that's a tough one to answer, because I talked to Garver about this, yeah. you know what I mean? And he told me crazy stories when Miami Inc. first came out, how tattoo artists were about to close shop and get a job down the street, the and, the, and that, that the show kept their shop open and pushed them over that hump to keep going. Now, I don't know if those same shops are still going to this day, but you know, there was more than one story like that. You yeah. know, so I know I don't know if those people got better. I don't. I hope. Th- I hope they didn't get worse. I hope maybe they learned something. Or, you know, yeah. or, or hopefully they used that incentive to better themselves in the trade. Gotcha. Or, you know, it's a. I don't know. What do you call it? It's a trade. It's a craft. It's a, you yeah. know. You're working with your hands. You're yeah. dealing with people. You know what I mean? I mm-hmm. I would like to say more of a service, if anything. Yeah. You know. Um, but honestly, like the. People were getting tattooed with my like families would get tattooed before the TV shows. Okay, so maybe now it's m- maybe more it's more accepted. But I remember yeah. tattooing mom, dad, kid mm. quite a few times. Lots of mom and dads, or like lots of moms and daughters. Yeah, always, always you know dad and son type yeah. situation. Like there always was something. You know, I mean now the TV stories, the TV say. show. Yeah, you know sometimes it, you know, the TV show. The one thing I really think. Not that it hurt tattooing. The one thing that kind of sucked the most about the TV shows is it gave everybody an opinion and a voice of something that they didn't really understand. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Now, if I'm a guy who does realistic color portraits, you know, and someone comes up to me and wants to do me to do a traditional tattoo, yeah, I can do it. Yeah. But this is what I do. And people want you to do something. They, they sometimes they try to always test you. They want you to do something out of your realm or whatever. Mm-hmm. And like, oh look, dude! Like when I got the spotlight, I remember these, like two days in a row, these German guys came in with these crazy drawings for Bob. And Bob's like, look at this. See everything on the wall here? This is what I do. Oh yeah, but I want this. He's like, oh, mm. I don't do this. You know, I'm not going to do this. So yeah. either you find someone else, or yeah. you could leave. You know, yeah. like just like <laughs> you know, like you're lucky if you got that from Bob. You he know what I mean? One hundred, yeah. You know, but. uh there always, there's always been that. There's always been families getting tattooed, and like I, the, I remember the first customers I had. Like I've tattooed their kids now, and I'm, oh, wow. I'm, I'm rounding the corner and tattooing their grandkids. Damn. And it's kind of like, what the, you know, this is insane. Yeah, yeah. You know, so. Oh, you hit that ringer. No, it's just no, it's just a vibrate. Let me turn it off. Um, but so, do you think that it, it exposed tattooing? It made tattooing like a, and not a household name, but made it realize that I don't know that it wasn't just for like certain types of people. That yes, yes, it, for oh, everyone. It had to have, you know, because you know you go to the you go to the liquor store right, and you go to the tattoo magazine. It's next to the dirty magazines, True. right? It was it was never like down below with you know car and driver. It was That's always up. Point, it was actually. always up high. You know You're what right. I mean? So it was always had this stigma, and yeah. you know, and even then, like. There wasn't anything dirty, you know. You know, maybe he had some boobs or something like that. You know, some butts mm-hmm. or whatever. You know, but it wasn't like the dirty magazine that it's next to. Totally. It, it's covered with the tattoo on top of it. Yeah. So, you know, the the tattoo shows definitely brought everything into light. You know, like it, it just really threw it out on the yeah. Miami Ink was huge. Pub, man. Miami was massive. You know, and I remember when it first came out, I'm like, oh, that wasn't honestly. I was like, that wasn't that bad. You know what I mean? But the thing is, when the, when you get the story every time, all the time now, like it, it wasn't like that. Yeah. But people never ex- never lived through that part totally. of, of no story. They've only yeah. lived through the part like, oh, you know, like some poor guy is talking about running over his kid, like backing know, up over. Dude. I'm like, you know, so I don't feel sorry for the guy. I feel sorry for the kid and what a jackass is that. I'm a father. Like, I don't mm-hmm. fucking leave my kids out of my sight till they're like, you know, <laughs> I, you know, but I had my daughter, I would hold her hand through everything. Like, yeah. you know, she'd want to get away. I'm like, no, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Till you know what the fuck you're doing. You're not doing shit. Yeah, true. 
you know, and you know, of course, now cars have backup cameras and all this, blah blah blah. Yeah. You know, they didn't have it then. You know, and then, and then now this guy goes on TV and says that. So now he's a ju- personally, you know, and I I don't want to offend anybody. But now he's made himself a slightly laughing stock. Like, how mm. did you just back up over your own kid? Yeah, you know, you weren't paying attention. He snuck up behind you, like you didn't close the gate. Like, what did you not do to mm-hmm. prevent this from happening? Yeah, you know, now that's gonna bring you some. Uh, may, okay, maybe it made him feel better to get it off his chest. Yeah. But at the same time, you think that guy, you see him on the street, someone's going to like congratulate him? No. You know? Like, and, and, yeah. But that, the other, you know, that brings ratings. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You know, like, yeah, you, you know, if you don't have something with conflict, me and Scott Sylvia were almost on the amazing race. Yeah, that's a great story. We, did, we didn't get on it because although we talk the most shit in the world <laughs> and you know all that we did not have conflict and the show yeah, is based true. on conflict there Drama. was a pro pro football guy with his wife that are getting divorced they're trying to keep it together yeah. a couple college buddies that you know don't see eye to eye you know whatever yeah. but there's always conflict we didn't have conflict yeah you know, we would joke like we could build a car, we could build a house, we mm-hmm. could, you know, we could probably flip over a car if we had to. Like, we you know, we had all these things, yeah. but we, you know, and we made fun of other people that were in the test. But you and guys got like, along, you were friends. But we had, drama. we had no drama. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we didn't get it. Yeah. We came close, but we didn't get it. But those guys on that show, they were just like friends having a show. They weren't put together by a, a station. They were actually friends who tattooed. That's what I liked about it too. Chris yeah, yeah. They all they all knew each other. Yeah. They all worked together some aspect or another. You yeah. know, they 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 had it going on. You know, so the, you know. Then they're still tattooing. Darren, Chris, and Brass, yeah, you know, Chris, yeah. All those guys. You know, and then they they paved they paved the way for a lot of people. You know what I mean? So all the shows that you see now. It's may have, may have, may have been you know five years later than they should have been, yeah. but you know because of Miami Inc. and the popularity that they brought it, you know. But at the same time, for tattoos, I also, I th- also thought it made made it be like, oh, I can tattoo too. That looks easy. I'm gonna do that too. So then you had a bunch of people opening up shops who weren't talented to even give a tattoo, and so people were coming to them because they just want to get tattooed. And- well, on that note, it's more the fact that the guy who can't get a job, yeah, because it's too saturated. And he's not good enough. Mm. So he saves his chips up or makes a loan and opens up his own shop with his own rules. And he doesn't have to listen to anybody. He doesn't have yeah. to listen to the old timers. or like, I don't have to do that because yeah. X, X, Y, Y. And those guys are unfortunately the ones that don't really, you know, they're, they're starting on a bad foot. Yeah. And then they, you know, they got to claw their way to the top. Like now it's ruthless. Tattooing is ruthless because, you know, with one click, you can reach however many followers you got. It's true, man. You know, the magazine took five months to get a picture in a magazine. Yeah. I hit one button, I reached 25,000 people. It's crazy, man. You know, and that's low. That, that To me, that's what I'm grateful. I look at other people, that's, I'm a quarter of what they got, mm-hmm. you know, with more experience and better work, but... Yeah. Somehow they've they've made it work. Yeah, well, you, yeah, going, you built a name and a career before the internet, though. That's yeah, you know it's, it's true. Your you know name I mean? speak. Your name and your work speaks for itself. I, I mean, I, I like that. I, I like tattooers. I like you know. I'll talk to any tattooer. I've never never. I don't shun people for what they do or don't do. Or yeah, they you know, were all doing it. Like you know, you, if you want to talk to me, I'll talk to you. If you don't, hey, that's fine too. I don't care less. You know, I have a ton, I have a million friend, old friends in this business. Yeah, and new ones. Yeah. So you know, however it goes down, it goes down. But yeah, the, the TV definitely blew it up. It just, uh, you know, it went for it. Yeah, I think I think it, from an outside perspective, as a collector, I think it, I think it helped it, and mm-hmm. more, it was more positive than negative. I feel, but well, I mean, but I'm not in it either. Right, you know, so it's, it's just you know, so let's say for example, you're, you're a tattooer, so moderate success, just working every day, showing up. You know what I mean? So now the TV show has created ten more shops in your neighborhood. That weren't there before, mm. you know what I mean. And maybe the kids are as good as you. Maybe one is better. Yeah, you know what I mean. So now you slice that pie that you were surviving with ten times. Mm. So that's that's the effect that's interesting. That, that the TV had. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like So you know, like there was a guy who was going out of business that somehow found this resurgence, and now you know he doesn't have to close his shop. Okay, so he survived that. But did he survive the ten shops opening up around him? Mm-hmm. 
You know, and like, and like given, you know, like we live in cities, so it could be every half mile there's a shop and every block. And is, for that isn't that respect radius thing? If they have yeah, that, it's that, supposed that, to be like this code. It's supposed to be. There's there's a lot of codes. Yeah. You know what I mean? In music, in business, totally. In tattooing, you know the code. You know, the code. I believe these codes are only true to yourself. Gotcha. You know, what I mean, because no, I mean. People have broken the code that have been over over flying again. that flag since it started. Yeah. So you know you're thinking to yourself like, wait a minute, you were the one who said that you shouldn't do this and you just did it. Oh well, it's different now. I'm like, no, it's not different. I don't care if you don't like them. I don't care if there's some other excuse. Yeah. You know, you, you broke the code. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not gonna wave my finger at you or anything like that. But it's just like, yo, dude, like, you know, you didn't even have the decency to not break the code. So mm-hmm. it's like everybody, everybody's on their own. You know what I mean? Yes, there is codes. Does it Should feel like be... everybody's out for themselves more than they were a community? Oh yeah, it's not. It's that's one hundred percent. No more. You don't think... No, not at all. I mean, there's pockets, there's clicks. Yeah, you know, there, there's always going to be that. But as a whole, like I remember when I first started in Orange County, I knew every tattooer from all the yeah. shops. Yeah, would see them out. Hey, what's up? You yeah. know, blah blah blah. This and that. You know. You know, sometimes I send people to other people, like, listen, dude, I don't do this, but maybe you should go to that guy because he does do this. Why would I tell you I can do something that I can't do? Totally. You know, sometimes people don't like that either. I'm like, well, you know what, dude? I'm not going to pretend to do something that I don't do. Mm-hmm. So why would I have this person suffer? Yeah. Like, give them what they want and what they need. They can go, you yeah. know, I, I want everybody to win. I'm, 100%. My, my problem is I want everybody to win. So I want everybody to work. I want everybody to do the tattoos that they want to do. I want their customers to be happy. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. So, but it's so different with social media now because everybody's got their own platform to push themselves, not so much their shop, but they put they can push like themselves as a personal artist and mm-hmm. and like you don't know, have to have portfolios. Put your pictures like you said on the internet. Boom, everybody sees it. Then I have to scroll through your shit. Okay, I like his tattoos. As right. opposed to like Tim Hendricks said, he would take pictures and different angles and get them developed, and we to get it back and then send them to people and check out my work and. That process is just like so DIY back. It's amazing, man, all the shit you had to do. Which is the same thing I told him is like going to a record store and finding a record and reading the thank you list and the shout outs and seeing the t shirts they wore. And then, okay, what's that band they shouted out? You had to search for things. It was, it was like a discovery thing, like it worked for shit. You know, it's different. Well, it's funny. My buddies, I would just had breakfast with like two generations of friends just the other day. And we were talking about the pilgrimage for the records. So we're, yeah. in, we're in South Orange County. So one record store in particular we go to was called Toxic Shock. It was a Pomona. I remember, I remember that. My mom told me about that, yeah. So we'd go. Someone would drive. I'll go. Well, let's say we had 40 bucks if we were lucky, 20 bucks. What's a record then? $6, yeah, $7, man. maybe. Yeah. I'll go up there. Everybody buys two or three records. Come home to somebody's <laughs> house. Somebody runs and gets a 12-pack. Someone's got a bag of weed. And we sit and we look at everybody's records. And we make a tape. While we're all sitting there just chopping Damn. it up, we make the tape, and of course the tape deck has a tape to tape recorder. So we make one tape and dub it four times. Sick. And so that was our if we weren't going to a show, if that was our day, you know, we'd finish the night off, you know, finishing our beers and watching wrestling <laughs> and have this tape. Yeah, there was for the ne- for you know, and then so either and then we'd make our own tape. You know what I mean? But then Pass okay, around and the, shit. then the next pilgrimage to the record store. You know, I saw this on Flipside. I saw this on Max yeah. and Rock and Roll. Yo, I want, you know, I, I didn't really like ordering stuff. I, I wanted to see it. I wanted to yeah, hold it. Yeah, totally. So let's go up there. Let's go to Hollywood. Let's go here. And then I remember there was a, there was a, a punk rock record store opened up in Laguna Niguel, which is on the other side of Mission Viejo. Mm-hmm. And that's where I got the first, the Chromax, you know, Age of Coral record. Sick. And I already had the tape. Yeah. And I don't think he remembers it, but the singer from Fu Manchu, Scott Hill, he worked there. Oh, wow. And I remember walking into this record store, and he's like, Juan, this is for you. You need, <laughs> you need to buy this record. You love that record. You know, and I, got, and I, and like, I but like I said, when I got him, I'm like, this doesn't sound like the tape. But yeah. then I was like, that's pretty fucking badass. You yeah, know you're still I mean? up front. I talked to John. He's like, your friend Juan was at the show, whatever. Like, you're still up front at the Chromax show. <laughs> they're 50 years old. Yeah, that's... He was, they were laughing. Him and Mackie were like, oh, dude, you were up the whole that's show. Cool, and man. then there's... Oh, Mackie told me that. That's right, yeah. Pictures surface, and I'm just kind of yeah. like, dude, like, why the hell do I want us in the back? Like, yeah. I want to sing along. Like, I the, when I saw him with GBH at Fender's Ballroom... When you were a kid. 1986. When they first came, me and my buddies she went to the show. Scary back then not too. even to see GB. We went to see GB. We love GBH. I think it might have been even Midnight Madness record, like one yeah. one of their not so more popular records. But we went to see the Chromax 
Because we all wasn't had, it scary back then seeing them like the skins and coming on stage. No, no. But well, we because we had South Bay skins. All right. So we had skinheads already. These are New York know? skins. But New York yeah. skins, you know what I mean? But the stage at Fenders was only like three feet high. Oh, maybe shit. maybe not much more than that. So if you go to the Olympic and the stage is four feet high, five feet high, and you're looking up. And it's just luminous. Those band members look massive. Yeah, that's true. You know what I mean? I see yeah. Colin from GBH now, and I'm like six inches taller than him. You know <laughs> what I mean? You know? And I know I haven't shrunk from that point. Yeah. So I remember going there, and I'm like, what the fuck? This is the best thing ever. Like, we're like the only ones kind of dancing around-ish. You know, there was other people. Original but lineup, yeah. Original lineup. And then next year they come back. I'm like, this is going to be sick. I'm like, wait a minute. Where's the singer at? Who's oh, this bass wow. player singing? Oh, interesting. It was Best Wishes. Wow, yeah, which I still like. I'm like I'm, I have to admit, My I, wife I, loves that I, record. I really like that record, and I'm so glad that John still plays Demoniac. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, because that song is one of my favorite songs on that record too. Yeah. So and that and the only one, <laughs> yeah. that's, 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 that's <laughs> the little punk rock ballad stuff. But that's what we used to do for these records. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like the process, it's all the process. It you is. Know, you can make a playlist on Spotify. Okay, I know that's cool. And it's cool because it is exactly yeah. what you would do. But, but searching and going to record stores and all that shit was so exciting, man. Dude, like putting, Treasure you know, hunt. doing the the needle and getting it perfect with the yeah. record on the tape and yeah, you know, like if a song dr- drifted into another song, you'd have to get put both songs on the <laughs> tape because you didn't want it to sound like that. Yeah, like I remember having a tape that had it had uniform choice. Like I remember, I remember, I remember the songs. It was like horror business, GBH. Uniform choice. Once I cry, uh, maybe the adolescent. But it's just, it just I, yeah. I, I, I hear I could hear the scratches on the tape that were on the records. You know, sick. And it's to this day, it's just like I, I, I will always search those songs just because I remember the time making that tape, driving around with that tape. Yeah, listening to yeah. it. You know, the, the memories, all the memories from it. What do you think it is about hardcore and punk rock music that? makes you still feel that way. It, I think it's more than any other type of music. You have those memories and those feelings and it still keeps you young and you still go to shows, you're up front singing. It's, it's, I don't know what it is about it, man. It's something so special. You know, I mean... I know, I know you like other types of music, no, but there's I something ho- about hardcore. No, like, I hope people find it. When I went to that first show at the Olympic and it was scary and yeah. it was big and I'm like sitting up there looking down at this pit and I'm like, I'm gonna go down there. Like I didn't know what to expect, mm-hmm. so I go down there. Someone runs into me. I push someone away. <laughs> then I run into somebody, and then it just overtook me. And like it was a sensation that, you know, I mean, who knows what it is now? You know, because yeah. we, we went to grunge and we were crowd surfing and all this stuff. Like, but no, it always dude. stay with us though. It was, you know, those things that I remember. Running in a fucking circle, yeah. Jumping off a five foot stage into a crowd of people, and you know, not really caring who was underneath you. You know, mm-hmm. hopefully you'd aim. I've always been lucky, so yeah. I, you know, <laughs> I, I have to admit, like you're in, a big dude in, too. Yeah, in my time, I've never not had anybody underneath me. Thank God. Yeah, but you know, just just fighting to get up there and fighting to get off. Yeah. And fighting to get up from the ground if I went all the way down mm-hmm. and helping someone else up. Like, it's like just the whole the thing. energy, a little bit of fear and excitement. Everything. And all that, just yeah. not knowing what, really not knowing what's going to happen next. Yeah. You know, that there's no other sensation like it. You know? It's, yeah. I feel, like being, I feel like being a tattoo and a musician have so many similar similarities. You know, you do what you love, you get to make your own. Your, your like schedule, you get to travel, you get to meet people. It's an all intertwined with music. It's pretty amazing how that it happened always, back then. It always, you know, you look at the history of uh, tattoos on record covers. Oh yeah, from the Rolling Stones, from Johnny Winter, from Rose a bra- you know Rose Tattoo, like all these, you know, yeah, way more than you would have ever thought. And you know, I wonder, you know, when Rose Stray Tattoo, Cats, you know, yeah. when they came out with their first record, did they think that that record was going to carry them for 30, 40 years? You know what I mean? Like yeah. you know, you, you know, they were they just wanted to rock. They were living in that moment. They mm-hmm. didn't know they were gonna be. You know, I saw Rose Tattoo. I think it was two thousand four, two thousand five, at this place in Munich, Germany. Oh shit! And uh, it was like a crazy. It's called Kunspar Ost. Uh, Dan Dan G, uh, Dangman was there. Like, okay. He was with Newfound Glory. Oh shit! Okay. So like it was a, randomly just ran into a bunch of people in Germany. Yeah. And you're at this show. 
And you're just like, oh man, these motherfuckers are old. Peter Wells, the guitar player, <laughs> old. And he's the one who actually tattooed Angry Anderson, old. Damn. And you're just looking at him like, but they're still up there belting it out, Killing you know? It, and yeah. it's kind of like, all right, you know, that's yeah. super sweet, you know what I mean? Like they're still they're trying, you know? Yeah. And, and it sounded cool, you know what I mean? Like that was, that was, I don't know if it was a predecessor to ACDC or something, but that, it, it, the same kind of Australian vocal yeah. type, you know, riff. Who knows? Dude? Yeah. I think there's something with, Doing what you love and not just tattooing and music that keeps you young and you you don't never really have to grow up. Obviously, we have a mortgage, we have kids, we take them to school, we own cars, all mm. this shit. But there's something about doing what you love and having no boss that keeps you young. I I feel no. It's you know if you can if you can parlay that into your life. Yeah. But but before I go into that, how you parlay it, you have to work hard. Mm-hmm. You have to make it happen. 100%. You know, like if you have a boss, you're making it happen. He's giving you direction to make it happen for him, to, for him to get results and for him to report to someone senior than him. Yeah. That's what working for somebody is. True. You want to work for yourself? You got to work your ass off. You yeah. got to make it happen. You don't wait for someone to offer you anything. You have to do it. You have to fail. I you know. have to pick yourself back up and you have to fail again. You know, every time you fail, you're learning something, you know, until you yeah. go, you know what? I'm not going to do it this way because the last two ways sucked. I'm mm-hmm. going to try this way. But you have to just keep trying. Yeah. You know, like that's, you want to work for yourself? Try to do something that you really love. Yeah. And stick with it. Like suffer through it, unfortunately. Yeah, for if, sure. You know, hopefully you get smart enough that if you finally realize it's not going to work, guess what? Okay, you're still young enough, you can do something else. Yeah. But- you know, you can't say, you can't sit there and be like, oh man, I try, you know, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. It's not a fucking fountain it's, it's, and it's not a sword and a stone. Yeah. You got to make it happen. 100%. You got to grind and fucking, a lot of sacrifice. Yeah, how many shows did you play? So many. That man. were, you know, not full. Shit, or, totally, man. you know, people like, you know, hated at us. the bar, you know, or oh, hated you yeah, or, you know, dude, whatever. 100%. You know, like here are the shows when I was growing up, they never really put bands that didn't go together. They they yeah. were kind of smart and they kept it. Towards the nineties, when it started getting nineties, yeah. then you'd have some like weird, like, what, what is this? Like the cult is playing with forty five yeah. grave and like yeah. you know, just and that's not even that weird. Yeah. But you know, like, you know, you got you know, you had to play some you gotta play some shitty shows, you gotta play some no showers, you gotta play, 100%. you know, some you know, getting ripped off by a promoter, your fucking van gets stolen or whatever. Shit gets stolen before, and a trailer gets stolen. You yeah. know, but you learn. Mm-hmm. And so then you come back. And then what it do you It makes do? you want it more and really hungry and then you want to grind harder and push harder. And you know, and then you, you make it your career. 100%. You know what I mean? And you parlay it into one life, one chance. You parlay yeah, it into man. helping kids yeah, achieving man. what they need to achieve. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're not telling them how to do, what to do. No. You're telling them... How to look into themselves and do it. You, you, can, you can only do it, you know, like I said, you got to work for it. You have to, you have to do things. If yeah. you don't do things, it ain't, it's just not going to transpire. It's just not going to happen. Mm-hmm. You know? You can't force it too. It's just going to, just got to. No, I mean, well, you know, sometimes you really, <laughs> you have to, you have to try. You have to well, force it. You can't it, force you know? people. I mean, you can't, I guess, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, there was these bands in Orange County. I think, I'm not sure, like, they were not, they weren't like doom metal. There was like this band called Phobia. They would always play with war, like a funk band. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, how the fuck did you guys end up playing mm-hmm. together? You know, I hear they play <laughs> together. I'm like, dude, completely other ends of the spectrum, you yeah. know? But they did. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, well. I yeah. remember our first tour was like, we're going to open up for Sick of It All and Civ in Europe for six weeks in the bus. And we had five songs out and one t shirt design. And we opened up every night. And sometimes people would just, Turn their backs. One person I heard the demo, we had a demo tape, but our friends took us out there because they were our friends and it was a rough. We were the opening, we were the le- legit opening, nobody knew the fuck we were. It just on the fly, like ex sick of it all, roadie or something. It was crazy. <laughs> but then we built from that, but like, people didn't know what to fuck expect. We had five songs and that was crazy. Well, it was mad about the first 45, you know, it was, yeah. it was it like Agnostic Friend of Freddy Fall singing it, you know, yeah, right? Nine so, years old. Nine years old, you know what I mean? Talk about being bred for it, you know what I mean? Like that's It's crazy, man. You don't get that anymore. You don't get that luxury. You don't. And people don't seem to really want to work for shit anymore. They just want to have it, you know, make a video, put it on YouTube, become famous, or, you know what I mean? It's just... But YouTube's made that happen. True. Like, you can't... It made it easy for people, you, you're right. You can't blame the artists. I remember when True. they were... I remember when they were plaster uh, postering here in Hollywood when YouTube first started. I was wow. working here, okay. and it was like a machine gun with a camera lens on it. YouTube, 
that was the logo everywhere. Mm. And I'm like, what is this YouTube? I mean, the phones weren't even smart yet, you know, right? You yeah, know? right. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> now, now it's so it's so it's, crazy, it's, man. It's, it's, and now, but they're not the only TV independent TV thing yeah. out there. So yeah, everything it can grow. Have you found? Would you, have you found it hard to change with the times in the tattooing world? Nah, be an old school guy. Nah, it, you know what? Just I, just roll I, with it. I, I roll with it. I'll check it out if I like it. I'll. I'll look into it and keep doing it or whatever. Like mm-hmm. when Instagram first came out, I was like, oh, you know, like, okay, I guess, you know? Yeah. And then I just did it for fun stuff and then, oh, yeah, follow me, you know, whatever. And then, you know, I started doing it for work stuff. Like yeah. if you look at the first one, there's nothing really important. It's just hanging out. And then yeah. work things started. I'm like, oh, you know, people get to see your work. Totally. And then I just, okay, I'm going to use it for that because that's what people like to see. Yeah, and People want to keep up with it's you in that aspect. We'll do that. So it's way easier in a sense for that as far as getting people to see you. know, because now it's linked to, you know, your Instagram's linked to your Facebook Twitter, and, or whatever. Yeah. So I just like, I push one button, you know, but I'm going to redo my website and just have it go automatically to that too. Yeah. So I don't have to, I don't even have to do anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's all there. Yeah. So. Did you ever want to quit tattooing? Nah, you know what? <sighs> I wanted to do photo stuff. I wanted to yeah, like, you're great teach, photographer, I wanted man. to teach photo stuff for help, to help kids. But it just never transpired. And that mm-hmm. wasn't really to quit tattooing. Like, I was going to take it. I was going to give up this for that. Yeah. I just thought it'd be something interesting to help kids. And, like, I, in my mind, I was like, oh, you know, you can't really fail that. You just got to work. You know what I mean? You do the work. And, yeah. you know, your eye is going to be your eye. If I ask you to, you know, develop something or do something the way it's supposed to be done, that's one thing. But mm-hmm. your creativeness is going to, creativity is going to, you know, do what it's going to do. Yeah. But now, nah, you know, like, the tattooing has afforded me. Everything, you know, and I yeah. never, you know, I someday I will do something else because I'm not going to retire doing this. Yeah. So when that time comes, everybody will know. Yeah. But for now, like you know, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm not, I'm feeling as comfortable as I possibly can feel still with, love with it. the work I do, and I love yeah. it. My customers are still great, so I'm just gonna ride that that, that wave of you know, it's been good. Yeah. And, and you know, it's not going down. A great career too. Yeah. Do you ever get any health issues from being a tattooer? Yeah, yeah. You know, you get sciatic. From, but you How know, much your, how's your eyes? Well, I had LASIK. So oh, shit, okay. no, no, finally, like 10 years later, I have to get reading glasses, but that's it. And yeah. I have them, you know, but everything else is fine. You know, like if you're working in something, unfortunately, like sitting or being stationary, you have yeah. to make you have to make your environment work for you, not the other way around. These totally. Like this convention I'm going to music. The hardest part of conventions is like the shitty chair, shitty light, yeah. shitty, just shitty, you know, everything around you. Mm-hmm. You know, and when I was young, I didn't care. I just wanted to be at the convention. Now yeah. I'm older. I'm like, fuck, I could be, I could be doing this at home just as busy, making more yeah. money, you know, with everything, every amenity that I need. Mm-hmm. So you just pick and choose what you got to do more yeah. than anything. And, you know, like, you know, I, at home, I've totally amended my, my chairs and armrests and like everything to work for me. Awesome. So... I'm on the blessed side of not having issues yeah. with my back or my arms or yeah. my hands or anything, my eyes. Like, it's just, I got it kind of dialed in for what I need now. Yeah. So I suggest anybody who's tattooing, <laughs> spend money, a lot of money on a chair that's going to make you feel better when you stand up from yeah. it every day because you're going to be in that chair for no less than, hopefully no less than two, three hours at a spot. A spot yeah. You yeah. Know, so. How about like being a parent and, and you being a tattoo artist and looking the way you look and- Going to the the PTA meeting, so going to the school to be a big kid is that is that because it's like like being in normal society as like a dad and like no, a it's pretty artist. funny. I've 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 done that. My I got, my oldest daughter's gonna be twenty seven. Yeah, and I remember going to her school, which is in Yorba Linda, which is like the heart of or another heart of Orange County. Yeah, and you know her aunt and grandma worked there, and she was like six or seven. And I'd go to pick her up and. You know, they don't really talk to me. They kind of like look at me from afar and do yeah. all this. But then one day, one woman was just like, "So, what's your story?" Oh. And I was like, oh, "I'm a tattoo artist. What I do for a living." You know, I didn't have. I don't even think I had my hands tattooed or my yeah. neck, and I still had hair, all this <laughs> stuff. You know, I did more, looked probably more like a rockabilly dude than anything. Totally. Oh, really? We just started talking, and that was it. Like she would come up and talk to me every day. Fast forward, my son in kindergarten. He's going to be going to middle school next year in San Francisco at the school he goes to. Yeah. There's one mom, as I'm picking up, and there's like a different area to pick up the kids from kindergarten. There's one mom just right up to me, same thing. So what's your story? You're all covered in tattoos and stuff <laughs> like, you know? And I was like, well, 
X, 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 Y, Y, Y. And she's like, oh, that's cool. You know what I mean? And then at another function, a few weeks later, I met her and her husband. And he started talking to me. Oh, wow, that's nice. cool. You know? And they were just genuine people. But then I was also volunteering a lot in that classroom. Nice. And the teacher is pretty funny. Like she had me like vacuuming. Like they're just like washing dishes. Like, you know, it's all kindergarten too. stuff, right? But the kids got to know me. And the kids, they could care less about yeah. the tattoos yeah. at all. I put band, I have, a, I have a chick with no top on on my forearm. I put a band aid over it. Nice. You know what I mean? Just like, yeah, they're going <laughs> to learn about it sooner or later. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I'm not going to f- force feed them this either. Yeah, that's interesting. So, and uh, as the years went on, I kept volunteering. At the, and so now all the kids pretty much know me know at the you. school, and the parents know who I, I am. I think you're cool too, I'm sure. And they, yeah. they, 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 they like me. They're all right. You know, they, I love the kids. The kids are. Kids are just the best. You yeah. know what I mean? It's funny to see them grow. It's funny to see them, their expressions, they're just how they react to people, yeah. you know, things, situations. Like, you know, there's also some shitty kids, mm-hmm. just, just shitty kids. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And one kid just moved away, and I was just like, ah, you know, he was causing all these problems, all the parents, like the kids, oh, wow. like, you know, and he left, all the parents went away. All the all the problems went away. Interesting. You know, it's kinda like, you know, I never liked him. So yeah. I was just but you know, well, like I said, I never liked you. You know what, dude? I never fucking liked you. <laughs> you know, you're fine. you know, you're ten years old, I don't you're like you. Out you, know, here, yeah. you know, but at the same time, it's just like, you know, I just like always like, eh. That Keep kid, an eye on him, that, yeah. That, so kid's, I'm up with that kid's a piece. Mm. You know what I mean? I even sat with my daughter when she was sixteen, there was some some girl at her party, just problem. I could just see it. You know what I mean? So you call I, it. I told her mom, and her mom's like, you're just being judgmental, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, all right. Six months go by, and I asked my daughter, like, hey, so whatever happened to that girl? She's like, oh, my God. She got in so much trouble. She did this, 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 and Damn, that. And I'm you like, called it. Girl, you just, it's unfortunate, but you learn <laughs> these things, you yeah. know what I mean? From your kids' friends. Yeah. You know, you, you, just, you know, hopefully parents keep an eye. Like, there's so many shitty parents out there, like, you know. Just starts just, in the home, all that. Just, shit, keep, that, just man. keep your eye on them a little bit, you know. know and get involved or something. You Why'd know? you have them? Just let them run, run, you know, in the streets. No, but it's know. crazy with tattoos too. That sometimes, I, well, I thought Max growing up, he was surrounded by so many uncles with tattoos. He thought it was like the normal. So if you saw somebody without tattoos, like what the fuck? Like, that's the new weirdo. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, that's what I tell people. Like when, when <laughs> if I have a customer, like oh, you know, I want to get one, but I don't know. I'm like, you know, you're the new weirdo, right? <laughs> you don't have any. You're yeah. odd mm-hmm. in this town. And they're like, oh, I never thought about it like that. Yeah. Like, you know, like, well, yeah, we like, well, you know, I, you know, if you want to get tattooed, I'll make the, give you the best tattoo ever. But, you know, only, you should only get it if you're 1,000%. Yeah. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, they kind of like, yeah, yeah what, did, what did you think it was going to be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yes. You know, mm-hmm. that's how it has to be that way. Yeah. It's true. It's cool as kids around you with tattoos because then they get older, they can say, oh, we met, we knew somebody we were younger. Our friend's dad had tattoos at the school. So then they go into the world and they realize that, not all people with tattoos are bad, you know. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. And the parents too. Like it's, it's. I, I, I've made friends with a lot of the parents that. Yeah. They, you know, they probably wouldn't say hi to me had they not known me or who I was or like had any interaction with their kids. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So like now they saw who I am. You know, what I mean, because I'm I'm also the guy who will jam up your kid if your kid's acting a fool. Yeah. I'm gonna say it. I think you know. I'll say it right in front of you. I'll be like, "Hey, yeah. man, what's wrong? You know, hey, what are you doing? You know, I mean, like, kid, be like, look at their parents, and parents be all embarrassed. Like, yeah, what are you doing? I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, what I mean, why? How come you're not paying attention? You know what I mean? Like, hey, yeah, get your kid under control. You know what's going on here? <laughs> You've definitely done that before, with Max, when you're younger too. <laughs> but you know, I mean, whatever. <laughs> you know, it's just, I'm just that dad. You yeah, know what I mean? I like so that. that's fine. Hands you know on, I mean? sure. yeah, yeah, you care. I'm, I am hands on a lot, so. Do you consider yourself an optimistic or pessimistic person? Optimistic. The glass is half full. Yeah. Always. You've always been like and that, right? you can right? always fill it up to the top. True. You know what I mean? Like That's a good just, point. You know, pessimism is easy. It is. You don't even have to try. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's, your, That's your first act of pessimism. Yeah. <laughs> just fucking giving up. It's true, man. That's a good point. You know, Charlie Roberts told me one of my favorite things. He's like, oh, you know, nothing beats a failure but a try. That's I mean, I, uh, awesome, you know, and I, and I say that to my son. I, I, it's funny saying <laughs> things to my son that he repeats to me, mm, and I'm just like, oh, you. I'm like, oh, who said that? Did I say that? Like, yeah, all right, I said that. You know, and it stuck. Yeah, thank I like God. That. That's you know awesome. I mean? So, just you just, you just gotta try. You yeah, know what I mean, like you just gotta make it happen. Mm-hmm. Do you have any, uh, have any daily rituals? No coffee. <laughs> like you know, and that's not even a ritual. I just have yeah. two cups a day, if that. One at breakfast. I like drinking coffee for breakfast. Mm-hmm. 
That's it. You know, like rituals. Nah. No working out. No yoga. I did Pilates for a bit, Sick. and now and now I just joined the gym. I just got a knee replacement surgery, so yeah, now that's right. The, the gym is to get the uh, my range of motion is really good, but now just to keep it moving. Like the most detrimental, I told you earlier, the most detrimental part of this healing process is sitting for a living. Yeah. So like I do stuff when I where I'm standing up all day making tattoo machines or doing all this other stuff. My knee doesn't bother me then. Yeah. Sitting for a couple hours after a tattoo or a podcast. It sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what's your what's your top five most inspirational people or bands or musicians or whatever? Top five thing impact on your life. Yeah, you know, my friends are gonna laugh at this, man. But I mean, so I would have to say not necessarily in order. I'll just go by just memory off the top of my head. Dave Grohl and the Foo Fighters. Great band. Like I've all, you know, I saw them when they first came, when he first came out with that record. And yep. they're playing in San Diego. And the show, I had the record. The show was perfect, you know. Yeah. Pat, but at the end of the show, they come back for an encore and it's like Pat Smear and all these guys, right? Yeah. And they played down in the park from Gary Newman. And mm. they were fucking rocking out. That's ha- interesting. And having the best time. Like, and I'm in the front. Yeah. And I'm watching, and I'd like to be in the front. I like to see what's really going I've seen on you in the front. Yeah. And I'm just like, and it gave me chills, and I was like, "Holy Kaboli! These guys mm-hmm. are just doing whatever they do." So then, fast forward. Oh, I would never expect food fighters from you, but I respect it. I love them too. Uh, fast forward. He did a TED talk at South by Southwest. Oh shit! And it's on. As you can see Dave it on YouTube, did? Dave did. Sick. And I think the year after was Springsteen. So if that dates, I, don't, I forgot the exact. He's date. a humble motherfucker too. Man. I listened to it, and it talks about him making music, how he started making music. Yeah. And I think the title of the TED Talk is like, How how I Got Into the Most Famous Band in the World. I think that's the name of it. Because he did. And it's just so, it's just such a good, like it's like a t- conversation at a bar. Yeah. You know, and I've seen him at a bar here in the Valley when they were practicing for, I think the, I think they did a show to practice for playing with Sting. So oh, they have yeah. this like private show at a bar that they always have it at this bar. And my yeah. friend invited me to come. Like, I'm in a bar seeing the Foo Fighters. That's like, sick. you gotta be kidding me. Yeah. But so just and, I, and then I took photos. Oh, when we took photos of uh, Juliet Lewis oh, and yeah, the Licks. Yeah. <laughs> and he's there and he just, you know, and he played drums on the record. That's yeah, right. And he met me before and he's like, I seen you before. What's your name again? I'm like, I don't, and I met him years before that. And I'm like, oh, I'm a friend of Chris's who plays in the band. Shipley, yeah, 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 you tattoo, right? I'm like, well, okay, awesome. my mind's blown. You know what That's I mean? Cool, like, man. so I, I'd have to say he's influenced. John Joseph, of course. Yeah. You know, like seeing that stuff, you know, just, you know, seeing him. I don't care about any of the drama stuff, you know, but yeah. I follow him and yeah. I. You know, you respect the hustle too, he man. He is been, working at it. You know, like, he's he, been through a lot he, of shit. He is not. Taking it for granted, yeah. And he works his ass off to keep competing, to keep singing, to keep the band, to keep everything like yep. it's work. Yeah, you know. And the band is fluid; like they just rip. You know Killer, what I mean? Man. So they all, everybody in the band is just so tight. Um, uh, tight as tight can be. You know, yeah. Like, so you know, that's the Chromags that, and Foo Fighters. You know, <laughs> so, you know, it's it's kind of a, kind of a big. Uh, that's kind of interesting. We played Japan once, and Foo Fighters were playing down the street, and me and my brother know Dave a little bit from the DC days, because Todd's been out crowd, played with mm-hmm. Scream. He was in Scream. And we got invited to the show. He went there, and then Dave was like bugging on my tattoos. He goes, let me show you my I took your shirt. He goes, I have the worst tribal. He was showing me all of his tattoos, like tribal crazy. You know, you know who did that, right? Who? <laughs> I believe it's Paul Stoller here from okay. Love, Tattoo. Tattoo. I'm not saying the tattoos are bad, but he's, just got, he's a victim. Of, I have tribal, yeah, yeah. too. We all have tribal. Oh, it's- Come on, I see him right now. Your pants. He showed me all of a sudden. I need some better tats. And it was, it was yeah. really nice. So like you, he was always nice and humble. I saw him playing Scream back in the day. Yep. But yeah, yep. that's awesome. I saw man. Scream too. Like so, so you got Chromags and Foo Fighters. Mm, no Clash, Ramones. You know, I mean, I love those bands. Yeah, but I don't have a personal collection to them. Right. So you did my Joe Ramone tattoo. Thank uh, you, man. Yeah, yeah. great. <laughs> and my Biggie you, one. You're too. very welcome. You know, so it's it's hard. I'm thinking about you know I didn't know John then either and I like I said I met Dave so whatever yeah. but you know I saw the Ramones a million times I'm blessed to see the Ramones a million yeah, times you know me what I much. mean so you know I mean 
Influential. I mean, they were great musicians. Yeah. You know, and they covered a, a big thing. I, I'm just trying to think of like things that influenced me to Could this. Could be a person too. Like, to what, a day. tattoo artist. A uh, tattoo artist. Man, you know, that covers a lot of genres too. Like yeah. you, can go, you can go actual style. You can go being prolific. True. You can go what, you know, you know, like the, let's say, okay, the guys I work with, like all of them, but let's say the two owners, you know what I mean? Yeah. They, they, I met them at a tattoo convention. They ran up in a group that I was hanging out with. They introduced themselves, and we were friends from that point on. Sorry. Not like every day calling each other, yeah, but we were homies. You know awesome. what I mean? And to the point of working together throughout the years in different spots. Totally. Then working together in San Francisco the first time I went there, and yeah. now them owning the shop. Scott Silvey yeah. and Jeff Rasher. You know, like just the amount of dedication and work that they put into stuff, and. I, sometimes the natural ease, mm-hmm. you know. And if we're gonna go tattoo artists, so they're they're one. I'm gonna put them That's as awesome. one. But the one I love to hate the most also <laughs> is Chris Garver, dude. Because that fool is Amazing, just man. so ridiculous and so <laughs> and so humble. Like I, you know, so humble. I work with them in Japan. He tattooed me the first time when I went to New York. Yeah. Um, Fun city, Jonathan we, Shaw shop. No, at New York Adorn. Yeah. Uh. We worked together at Shamrock here in Hollywood and just, you know, prolific also, so technical, so everything. And, you know, he's he's a a lot of everybody's favorites. Yeah, man. You know, and you're just like, God, you know, like, how how does that (laughs) happen? You know what I mean? How does the one person, you know, I would think you'd run out of ideas somewhere. You know what I mean? But. The, those guys that are like that prolific, you know, and there's I could list off, I could rattle no, hundred no. people, you know what I mean? But but Garb is special, man, and he's left-handed. Oh, shit, I <laughs> are know you that. kidding me? You know mm. what I mean? Like even worse. <laughs> and now he's got to show off, you know. Um, that's awesome. He, he's a tattoo. All of us, me, Matt Henderson, Stigma, Freddie, all of us at Fun City. I think it was illegal to tattoo like in ninety ninety one. Oh yeah, you had to call from a phone yeah, and get so let in. All that shop, Fun City. He's the tattoo is all there, man. It's on St. Mark's, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah amazing tattoo. It's man. still there. It's yeah. still there. Um, so, God, who's the, Chris Garver? I mean, who's yeah, Chris Garver, Scott and Jeff, you the know, owners. Hip-hop, you know, hip hop inspirations. <laughs> mm, I mean, I love hip hop. Yeah. You know, I really, I mean, inspirational. I don't know. Like, I really like Run the Jewels. Is yeah, what I dope. Like. Shout out to Killer that, Mike, man. Good dude. The, the stuff that, that he does, yeah. you know, like I, I don't follow LP so much, but you know, like I see the stuff that he that Mike's doing. The trigger like, shows, you know, yeah, yeah, Trigger man. shows, it's like it's <laughs> wild, you know. You know, he, I, he, I like that he's just so honest and just yeah, I just you know, I seen this meme the other day. It's like it was it's like ant the pro black isn't anti white, and you know, it's it, it, it that can cross so many things. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean, like. You go to different races or religions, and not in the religious aspect, but like taking care of one another. Totally. You know what I mean? Like, you know, that is something that a lot of people don't do, you know, and he's professing that to flourish and succeed, we need to help everybody. You know, let's say we need to help, he needs to help a fellow black man get up, get his own business, get his own money, do all that stuff. Anybody can do that. You know, I mean, I can help. Mm-hmm. You know, if I wanted to help every Mexican baker in you know, the in you know San Francisco area, I like, could pull it together and you know, like everybody help each other out. You know, that's he's, he's preaching stuff that yeah. is is for survival and for flourishing. Yeah. You know what I mean? And people maybe take it the wrong way. I like it. Yeah. You know, I mean, I like hearing something different. Yeah. It's like that that new uh, Clash podcast with Chuck D narrating. I heard it. about this man. And it, it the first question everybody's been telling me is. Uh, why does he do that? Like, why is he the one to? Uh, uh, why is he the one to narrate this this uh, podcast? And if you listen to the first episode, it'll all come to light why he's the first one to narrate it. And it's just a super good, it's a super good, you know, a historical account of what's going on with them. So, but you know, I, okay, if you're gonna if you're gonna throw hip hop in there, I'm gonna have to say. Well, you know, run the jewels, killer Mike, and what he's got to do. You know, that, those guys are that, that's probably my favorite one. As I'm pissing, keep and now we're a little pee break and pinning the dog break.
right now here. You're a public enemy? I like public enemy. But I'm talking about the now. You know, um, Rollins? Always have. Always have. I love the Rollins. I love the Rollins. You know, yeah, yeah. Sorry, guys. I said this. <laughs> no, Rollins band is great. Uh, uh, two things I'm surprised you said, which is amazing, is that Run the Jewels isn't an old artist. Neither is um, Foo Fighters. And it's cool they're on your top. It's pretty amazing, actually. Mm. You're listening to newer shit. You're not just like in this little bubble listening to my old shit, my old, you know, reminiscing on some old hardcore shit. Mm. But yeah, Run the Jewels are amazing killer mic shit. Um, so you got, now you got Run the Jewels, Foo Fighters, Chromags, Chris Garver, Scott, Scott Sylvia, and Jeff Rasher. Jeff Rasher, there you go. Owners of Blackheart. That, that's pretty amazing, actually, especially because they're your two close friends, too, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like people mm-hmm. you know and, and pretty much live with at the shop. Well, and, who's going to influence you more? Yeah. The pers- the people that you spend the most time with. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know, that's part that's part of being a parent too. Like you see who your kids are hanging out with, guess what? They're not far behind. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you can guide them, but you just know like, you know, if your kids friends are shitheads, you know, either, you know, hopefully he doesn't decide to choose the path. Yeah. But don't be surprised. <laughs> You know. It's who you surround yourself with, too, man. Yeah, it's yeah. who you surround yourself with, you know what I mean? I like, 100% you know, feel that. If you say, like, it's like the, the PMA thing. Like, yeah. You know, now, not everybody around me is on that is me, on that train, you know what I mean? But, you know, I'll be on that train. Totally. You want to jump on and off? Cool. Yeah. Like, I'll, I'll be here for you. you yeah. Know, you want to talk about good shit, bad shit? Yeah, you know, all my friends are straight-edge vegans and all that shit. It's not even like that. You know, my band isn't. People think I'm hanging out with all these people. They're exactly the same. That'd be so boring. You know what I mean? You surround yourself with people like that. But you do have to surround yourself with people who can bring you up and inspire you and you look out for each other. That's right. Because you hang out with people that bring you down. It just brings you to a dark place and then mm-hmm. it's hard to get out of that, you know? That's or being true. guilty by association too, hanging out with friends who are kind of crazy, which I've lived through already. I've, we've but, all, they're still, but they're still my friends. Yeah, I love we've them. We've all people. lived through it. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I've seen the most stupid and, and like, <laughs> been, I've seen the most stupid shit and had to get a car with these fools. Like I don't even want to be here. If I could teleport myself out of this yeah. situation right now, I would do it in a heartbeat. But your friends, you can love them. And yeah, and it's like, well, I had no choice. I'm just stuck in the car. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, like, all right, well, fuck. You I've know. definitely been there too, man. You know, so yeah, you that's, just, that's you survived it, and you won't go back. You know, I was having phones back then. Yeah, fuck, it was ridiculous. People be locked up for life. Yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, well, maybe they could be locked <laughs> up for like now. You know what yeah. I mean? My final question: Do you have any regrets in your life so far? Hmm. We all got regret. Sure. Uh, I wish I went to college. I wish I definitely went to college, but went back and did that. But I don't even know what I majored in. But anyway, I don't know. Not really, then, huh? No, 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 no. I'm just filtering through them. There's, a, mm. there's, there's a bunch. There's okay. a bunch. But hmm, it's a. It's a hard one. Hey, babe. Mm. You don't have to answer. You don't want to answer. No, I want to answer it, and maybe it'll uh, maybe it'll help someone else. Mm. I wish. I had a voicemail from my mom mm. that I could listen to. When that's I, amazing, man. That's when I need it. Yeah, that's my biggest regret. I didn't have voicemail on my phone forever, and uh, that was it. Wow. So that is my biggest regret. So, so you basically you said she tried calling you during the time and nothing set up, or I didn't want it. I didn't want to deal with phones. You know, I'll call her back. You know what I mean. Uh, and I always called her back, but my daughter would send me the voicemails that she has. Oh shit! You know, and I just like oh, the worst. Damn man, so that's heavy. That's that's my biggest regret. Yeah. Fuck. On that note, man, we're gonna end this podcast. <laughs> I'm like, I have to give one a hug now. I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah, that's it. Thanks for answering that. Being honest, man. Fuck, that's real shit. Fuck, man. 
Well, I love you. I love you, Juan. Thank you. Thank you for being on my podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. We covered a lot of shit on here, and um, obviously, we could just talk about tattoos all the time. I like to hear people's story. That's the whole point of this podcast: is to talk to my friends and people who inspire me and touch my life, touch my body physically with tattooing me. <laughs> people that I've I've met throughout my life and got me to the place I am today and made me who I am today. It doesn't matter if they're my friends are all from different walks of life, but they all inspire me in some way, and I love to hear their stories before they became who they are now. Right. Um, but I think we touched on a lot of stuff, and I appreciate you answering that question. That's a hard one. It was um, a tough one. I, yeah. you know, I, I've been thinking about it lately. I drive. Yeah. I get up early and I go do stuff. And I remember, like driving down here, was like the drive from San Francisco to Orange County. Yeah, is difficult now because when my mom passed. Like I just remember uh, driving, like oh god, like this was dumping rain, and I was coming down here, and I wasn't expecting it to happen like it happened yeah. but it did you know mm-hmm. what i mean so it's like i've been down here a few times since and it's just like i just hitting that road leaving the bay and i was like oh i remember the last you know just that that that's my memory of that drive now yeah you know and it always will be so yeah. it's just kind of like yeah okay. you know what's interesting what just happened just now too is like my mom got emotional in the first episode because her one regret was not letting her three boys have closure on their father and not go to... Now, now, now I'm going to cry. Yeah. Now you're fucking me up. Not let her sons go to... Not let me and my brothers go to the funeral and sing about it to my dad. We never had that closure because the last time I saw my dad, he was on the bed with me and then he went to the hospital and I never saw him ever again. So that's the reason why my mom broke down. Now I'm breaking down the first episode. It was like, she never let us go to the funeral because she thought we couldn't handle it. So we're fucked. We don't need therapy. I'm definitely going to get therapy soon about my dad. I've met crazy dad issues. My, both my brothers have it. And we had it both on this podcast, and they both said this is very therapeutic <laughs> being on this podcast, my mom and my brothers, because we talked about so much shit I knew nothing about. I never knew my grand, f- grandmother shot my grandfather and killed him. <laughs> was locked up for 24 yeah. hours in, all, in Troy, New York for self-defense. He used to beat her all the time. All this shit. My dad threw a cop through a plate glass window. He was on a fucking chain gang in Troy, New York crazy shit from this podcast and opens up a lot of emotions and floodgates and um so yeah that's the one we got my mom has and i don't know if i resented from that or my brother's dick because they were older but yeah we definitely never got to say goodbye to my dad and have that closure so all we have is this go to visit him in taunton mass where he was buried and shit right but uh yeah man the regrets shit is uh it's heavy shit i, I don't know if the word regrets even the word to say for it. you just you wish you know what i mean i don't, I don't know well you know Wishing is one thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're, I wish I, mean, I did that. You know, well. Because regret's such a harsh word to have the rest of your life to no, have No, but this. that is a regret. Yeah. Because that's something, you could keep wishing. Yeah. Regret is something you could definitely never get back. Yeah. So you're correct. Yeah. But it's just, it doesn't make it any less heavy. This has been a very emotional episode. <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> well, thank you, man. I love you, man. Thanks I for being you here, too, man. Bud. This was awesome, and we covered a lot of shit. So check out Juan Puente, um, Classic Juan on Instagram. You can see all of his work. Everything is up to, right? That's the one? That's the one. Same name on Facebook, too? Yeah, just one point there, I think, on yeah. Facebook. One point there. <laughs> Much love, guys. Uh, one, one life, one chance. <laughs> one, one life, one chance. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening. Um, please rate, review, uh, subscribe. If you haven't subscribed yet to this podcast, please do that. And whatever platform you are listening to this on, I'm glad you found me. You can rate me and review me on there also. So thank you guys sincerely for the support. I cannot wait for you guys to the next one.